Okay, maybe we should work in. So we start with the refuge and bodhicitta and then the guru yoga. <laughs>
<clears throat> when you go to the theater, when you arrive, you take your seat, and in front of you there's a curtain, and then the lights in the house, in the theater, go down, and the curtain opens, and the stage is there, open, and often already actors on the stage. 
if you go to an orchestral concert, there's not usually a curtain. Musicians come onto the stage, settle down, pick up their violin, tune it nicely. You see the preparation, then the conductor comes on, everybody's clapping, then the silence, then they begin. These are very different ways of beginning. One shows a little bit of the preparation, the getting readiness, but in the theatre it's already ready, it's just the curtain opens. So when we say open to the open, the open is already open. <coughs> the curtains are our preoccupations. <coughs> what we are normally looking at are mental constructs, our ideas about the world, which are opaque, like a curtain you can't see through. When the curtains open, or you could say dissolve, then it's just movement in space. The stage is always empty. Various things are moving in it. When we don't see the empty stage, we arrive as it were full. It's not that we are opening the curtains. <clears throat> the curtains open when you don't attend to them. As long as there is attachment and desire and aversion, this generates the thickness, the opacity, the impossibility of seeing through the curtain. The curtain is just thought forms which are believed in. If you don't believe in the thought form or the feeling or the sensation, it arises and passes. And then you see, oh, this is the radiance of the mind. This is the luminosity of the mind. It doesn't look luminous. It looks heavy because it's mixed with the grasping thought that says, this is, I am. So as soon as there is an assertion of something, a knowledge of what is there, a knowledge of what is here, you get curtain. So when we wake in the morning, where do we awaken? Here, we awaken in this place. What is this place? Wrong question. If you ask what, you're already into construction. It is here. You awaken into light and sound and moving experience. It's ungraspable, but here. So that's why when you awaken, if you can, just re <coughs> excuse me, relax into the out breath, just here. As soon as you start thinking about, I'm here again, or I'm in my bed, or I have to do this, curtains are closing, you're projecting onto the curtains as if they were a cinema screen, and then you have the karmic movie of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and that runs and runs. So, waking is very, very important. What are you waking into? Who is waking? Don't construct this, just stay with the inherent thinness, clarity of arising and passing. We often have this, I have to get myself ready for the day. I have to gather myself together. I have to shape myself. Go to the bathroom, maybe have a shower, if you're a man, shave, or get ready to put your clothes on, go out into the world. If I'm not prepared, it'll be a bit much. This preparation itself is getting into the gearing of subject and object. And in that situation, the, the preparation is like getting hold of the clutch that allows you to shift gear from reasonably relaxed at home to into the world. 
And in that gearing, you're then dealing with events which are arising and you have to do and I'm doing. And there's a lot of background confirmatory um, commentary going on, even if it's not very conscious. Will I be safe if I'm unprepared? When you prepare, you take up a position. The positioning creates a kind of definition or solidity. So it, <clears throat> uh, here below me is a red carpet. If we imagine that this red carpet is the shape of a room, and I get up and I go to one wall and I push on the wall. I, the wall is fixed and definite and it gives me definition because I can feel the pressure in my muscles. <sighs> I'm here. I have something to lean on, something to assure me about who I am. So there is a, a kind of validation but also a restriction because I'm next to the wall, go over to the other side, push on the wall. It's the same kind of experience. I have definition. This is a limit. The limit maintains me in my limitation. But if I go back to the middle of the room, nothing there, nothing there, nothing there, nothing. Nothing to lean against, nothing to confirm that I'm okay, reassured by being off balance and having the support of something. Here, if I don't want to fall over, I have to find the line of gravity. I have to be centered. This is more subtle. This is not subject to object. This is subject to subject, or more like the Vipassana. You get a subtle feeling in your body, whether you're off balance or not. There's the proprioception and the sense, oh, oh, I can feel something in my hip. So that would be like the Vipassana. Too much pressure on the left hip, so tilt over a little bit. Going on to the right knee, oh, and then you get it going right down, then it's very easy. And from this position, I can go in any direction. I'm not predetermined. I can respond into whatever occurs. So this is the meaning of openness. I'm open to the open because I'm not protected, I'm not positioned, there's no pre-organization. If you're grounded, it's, you're ready to respond. So if you get the sense of this, the skills, the knowledge base and so on that you have built up can either be a kind of defensive screening, a kind of inner clothing that you put on and you access and you get into role in your preparation like a, an actor getting ready to go on the stage, or it can be laid out like a kind of buffet, available resourcing as required. And if it's not required, we don't take it up. So the hands are empty and they can respond to whatever's there. As soon as the hand has something, it is restricted. As soon as you get into role and experience that as a self-definition, you have a shape, you have an identity with which you can mediate your relation with other entities, other identities. But actually, the price of this shape is a false belief about who you are. I am this. I exist. I can define my existence. That's very different from I'm here, open, there is potential, and the potential can mobilize very quickly into the situation. Do I need to act? 
or not? Let's see. I can't know before it comes. Let's see. If the resource is to hand, but not in the hand, then you have that freedom to move. But when you've already grasped at something, when you preformed as, I'm a teacher, I'm a this, I'm a that, and it's, <clears throat> it feels like a supportive identity, then we need to take care. Of course, most of us, of necessity, have to take on roles. We might even enjoy taking on these roles. The issue would be, can we take on the role in the manner of a dream? It is as if I am a school teacher, and so this is a performativity, a co-emergent performativity, a bit scripted, but a bit spontaneous. At any moment, school teaching could stop. Some unhappy student could come behind you and hit you on the head with a brick. <laughs> you would be, now I'm in the role of hospital patient. I have amnesia. I, I must be someone, but I can't quite remember who. At any moment, these things happen. Builders fall off buildings. People get washed off ships in the sea. Sudden crises arise that bring about all kinds of situations. Environment onto the subject or internal heart attack, stroke, etc. Reformation. I can no longer occupy this role. So if you are aware that role is not formal and fixed identity, it's simply like an actor. So when you get up in the morning, you have presence, you're open, and then you get into role, which is formative as expression, not formative as identity. Does that make sense? So when we think about Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya, the Nirmanakaya is an apparitional form, a kind of dreamlike form. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have an impact. It means it lacks self-substance. And so it is appearing as, and you encounter the appearance, but there is no fixed essence or personal identity of behind that appearance guaranteeing it, it is simply displaying. What is behind it or under it is the field of light of which it is part, the field of appearance, which is inseparable from emptiness. So no matter what shaping you have to take on in the course of a day, it is a shaping of the potential of the ground. When you take it, when you seem to abstract it, take it out of the field so that it's yours, then you create a boundary around you and instead of having the sense of the co-emergent pulsation as you are in role, is if you start from your own position as a teacher, this is what I say, but you become a teacher by teaching. Teaching a verb, an, a, an activity, a movement, an interaction requires a class and, and somebody teaching. So through teaching, the person teaching becomes the teacher. It is generated through interaction and it is not internalized. However, in our social understanding, we conceptualize these identities. So you're a new teacher, let me show you around the school. You're an experienced teacher, maybe you need to deal with that very rebellious class. People take the identification and then use it to move you around as a resource in terms of the variations of the field. So what's important in this is to follow exactly what the text says don't block the movement, 
The movement is co-emergent, but don't thicken it by the idea that the verb generates nouns. There is a doing or an unfolding, and the verb is not subject to object, it's intersubjective, it's a, an emergent linking, patterning, which is here for a moment, <coughs> and it has no product. <coughs> By teaching, you could say you become a better teacher. By teaching, you have more moves of how to teach. Teach slow students, teach brilliant students, teach disruptive students. That's like the pizzeria. You have more bowls with more ingredients, you can make more kinds of pizzas. Does it make you a better teacher? That conclusion or formulation is useful if you're applying for promotion or more pay. But functionally, if, it, if you take up a position, I know what I'm doing, then you become only a teacher and you cease being a learner. And probably people who are not learners shouldn't be teaching. So it's an interactive pulsation. And if you're a learner and a teacher, then you're fresh in the moment because the moment is allowing this arising to occur. So how we enter the day is very important. We have a fundamental availability, which is the openness of the mind. And if we're not merged into and identified with neurotic patterns, karmic patterns, hopes and fears, the furniture of the mind, then we move according to the circumstances. And then we do that in the course of the day. And then at night, when we come to sleep, it's much easier to release yourself from the identity of the day. We accumulate friction as by something meeting something. I am the teacher. This class is hell. I really don't want to teach them anymore. They do this. They are like this. And I'm finding it really difficult to work with them. So now we've got friction and tension and at the end of the day, I'm exhausted. There's no pleasure in this. It's just a battle, one thing after another, firefighting. What's the problem? <clears throat> the students have a lot of energy and movement, and the teacher is trying to hold it together. The teacher has been given the task of herding cats. <laughs> Class 4A. <laughs> Hit them with an old fish. <laughs> what to do? They're wild. Of course, the difficulty is in school systems, you can't say, right, we're going out, we're going to run around the park ten times. Back in again. Get tired. <laughs> If you don't have freedom to respond to how it is, then you're stuck holding on to a position that has a mismatch with the energy of the situation. You're frozen like ice, they're becoming like steam, and the meeting point of water and water commingling is, is difficult. So there, of course there are many, many uh, problematic situations like this. The key thing is don't defensively firm up, don't take up a position, this movement will wear you down if you go into resistance against it. What else should, shall you do? You need to think. Given the parameters of the school, what are you allowed to do? Could you get up and sing to the class? Could you tell them a joke? What, what is available to shift the energy of the system? Releasing yourself from how you conceptualize what your role has to be.
when I couldn't get on the flight in Heathrow and I wait a long time and I finally get to this Perspex covered desk and the, the, the little gap in the person was very low so all the people on the other side are <laughs> thinking up at this wise person behind and they're just shit and they can't apologize they are there as the representative of a fucked up system but they mustn't take responsibility because they're worried about liability and people wanting compensation and so on so you have a completely sour situation. And this person behind the desk, probably not paid very much money, hating their job with all these angry and confused people saying, what are you going to do for me? The person's going on the screen saying, what am I allowed to do? He's not a free agent, not an empowered agent, has no executive authority. It's just a cog in a machine. But we're wanting somebody to be there. And he, they can't be there. Just you can see how modern work systems and social systems are can be enormously punitive. That if you don't have the freedom to be in the middle, not resting on any formal structure, the feeling of oppression and the build-up of anxiety can happen very quickly. And then, of course, one defense against that is disassociation. Just do my job. If you have a complaint, there's the complaint slip, fill it in, no one will read it, but you fill it in, go away. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. But you're paid customer relations. Nothing to do with me. Blank. And we experience a lot of this in the world, trying to phone through to an internet company. <laughs> you're held 20 minutes on the line, then somebody comes in and they clearly haven't a clue what you're talking about. You think, you're unqualified, you're supposed to be an expert response. What the fuck? What is this? Who are you complain to? You can't find them. There's no telephone number. You've got to go through their system. There are many, many forces of agitation. So whenever you form into, this isn't right, this isn't correct, I'm being insulted, da, 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 and you feel that solidification, the one thing you can predict is I will feel friction, I will get agitated, I will feel angry and anxious. Theatre of samsara, what is arising is my own karma return to me. <laughs> I must have been a real fucker in my previous life. <laughs> How on earth did I end up like this? I must have kicked a few asses in my time. And now it's coming back. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is what it is. So if you don't struggle against it, at least you, you lose the tension. Because going back to the point is, as you go to sleep in the evening, if you're carrying a lot of tension in your body or in your voice because you've said things you regret or you haven't said the things you feel you should have said, you missed the moment, you couldn't find the connectivity, or your mind's going around reviewing situations, it's very difficult then to bring at least some awareness into the unformed the unformed arises as oblivion, as the wipeout of dualistic consciousness, because there is nothing for consciousness which needs an object to hold on to. But awareness can have some sense of being present with nothing. Which is why in the Dzogchen tradition, you would do darkness retreats. They sit in the dark where there are no, there's no sense stabilization of what's occurring. Consciousness starts running around. What was that? Where am I going? You bang into things, try to remember the shape of the room. And then gradually, you're just there in the dark. Things arise from the dark. Memories, experience, lights, colors, all kinds of things. It's just the movement of the mind in emptiness. But in order to do that, you will have to be <clears throat> available to the ungiving space. The darkness is not giving you anything. 
And then in that space, you can have different kinds of experience arising. But if you're trying to hang on to it and there's nothing to hang on, it doesn't work. So usually we just fall asleep into this dark pit. Then you may have some dreams and then you, you wake up. So the key thing is always the past is gone. I'm here. Here is just here without conceptual location, without analyzed duration, and the future hasn't come yet. So if you're falling asleep and you do the three R practice, Guru Yoga of the White R, just, and in that moment of openness, you may be sitting up in the bed, you just fall asleep. So open is opening to open, or open is no longer veiled against the open by its own self-preoccupation. And then, if dreams arise, you have more chance of being present with the dream, because the whole day has been like a dream, in which appearances have been occurring, and it is as if this is, uh, this is something occurring, but then it, it dissolves very quickly. All the events of the day are like a dream. You get up, you wash, you go, go to go into the building. You have to remember, oh, mask, you put your mask on, you go in, you go through these various things. So they have plates and bowls. Maybe porridge. Don't take a plate, take a bowl. Bread, take a plate, not a bowl. You are co-emergent with the available ingredients. Some thought arises in your mind that you'll try something different for breakfast. And so you mobilize in a different way. This is just emergent. You can send it back to yourself as a construct. Oh yes, this, I'm not going to have any jam because I don't need extra sugar, da 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 da. You can have a plan and then you can enact the plan, or you can just see how you feel. Let's see. And you trust the moment. Either way, it's food, it's not poison. So it doesn't really matter too much. So in that way, l lessening preparation, relaxing so that you avail yourself of the potential of what you take to be your body, voice and mind, and the environment, then you can, then you can move. So that's really what the text has been pointing to. Don't overthink. Think thoughts are movements. If you build a house of thought, it will be like they say, this Gandharva's palace. It's, it's just a dream world. It doesn't exist. It's a big idea. Dictators formulate a thousand year Reich. Ordinary people like us formulate plans of what we'll do when we retire, or what we'll do when we get back to our home, or what we'll do next weekend. These plans have no substance to them. If they're practical, that you have to pay a bill, or you need to do the shopping before the shop closes, that's actually contactful. That's you as one phenomena relating to the shape of another phenomena. But if it's speculative, if it's without any contact with the actual shape of the world, it's a waste of time. Because the thought goes by, and the thought goes by, and the thought goes by. So how will we remind ourselves of the simplicity? One of the things you might find that you could do is develop for yourself very simple reminders. So when we talk of wisdom and compassion, 
sometimes you say this is like yab yum. The, the male is compassion or method and the female is wisdom or emptiness. So we have Padmasambhava here and he's holding this uh, Katvanga stick which represents the, the yum, the female. This is the wisdom and he is the method. That's quite a lot to remember. So it could be more simple, like primitive graffiti. A triangle pointing down. This is the yoni. This is the, the female genitalia. A triangle pointing up. This is the lingam, the male. And these two triangles crossed over, cross triangles. This is called a dharmadaya or a churjung. This is the source of dharmas. So when the male and the female come together, this is what they generate. Wisdom and compassion generate everything in the world. It's a symbol Hindus use, Buddhists use. Sometimes you put a dot in the middle and then a circle around it to make it a whole uh, mandala. These uh, drawings are called yantras. They can be developed hugely like the Sri Yantra that has so many triangles. But that's the most basic one. So then you just have a little symbol like that. You could wear it on a ring, you could wear it as earrings, or you could doodle it and draw it, just to remind yourself of drawing. Put it up on the wall. A conjunction, a productive conjunction. Self and other, or self and environment. This is also a productive conjunction. It's not that there's one thing here and one thing there. It's these pulsations generating pattern, pulsation generating pattern. The waves in the ocean sometimes run against each other and you get uh, the little bubbles on the surface or little droplets, the spume that goes off, just like that. Sometimes the mind's very softly rolling, hardly a wave. Sometimes it's very stormy. <clears throat> But it's the pulsation there of that arising. So you know your life, you know how you get lost, you don't perhaps want to get lost so much, so how can you remind yourself not to get lost? So little reminders like that are very useful. Art is primarily about that, the whole structure of Indian temples, the architecture, um, outer courtyard, inner courtyard, main temple, doors open and close. That Hindu architecture comes into Buddhism. That's how we talk about these mandala palaces. These are symbolic reminders not to get lost. From the point of view of Mahamudra, you cannot get lost. You are never lost. You're only dreaming that you're lost. You're always actually here because there's nowhere else to be. Like with the example, two brothers in bed, <clears throat> one's asleep, one's awake. The dreaming brother is here, but not here. The awake brother is here and here. So even when you're lost, you're not lost. So from this point of view, don't take a negative reading of the five poisons. The five poisons are inseparable from the five wisdoms. If you take them as real, that is to say as vehicles of an energetic relation of subject to object, I like you, I want you, I desire you, or I don't like you, I hate you, I don't want to be anywhere near you, then you have a concretization of these two polarities. And they're either moving towards merger or isolation, which is, again, what the texts always say. Don't merge, don't separate, just stay on the point. If you stay on the point of being angry, anger vanishes. Desire vanishes. Jealousy vanishes. When you're in it, 
the thoughts link the feelings link the sensations in the body and it seems like a whole package which is true and true and true because you feel whacked by it you know you're being formed by this positioning and then something else happens your big dream your fantasy maybe we could do this or that okay let's see let's see is already halfway to freedom <laughs> it's the plan that ties you in knots. I want, I could make it happen. Maybe we could do this. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe. But maybe it's not, not available. Okay, let's see. And then you see, yes, maybe. No, maybe. Something happens. Life goes on. Rolling along. One thing after another. If there is over-investment, then there's trouble. Now, what does over-investment mean? Investing too much. Country roads like this, they often have little bridges, and then they'll have a sign up that will say what load, what weight that bridge can carry so that the truck driver can be careful not to go over a bridge that's likely to collapse. What is, what is the burden that you can carry? How many hopes and fears can you carry? Because actually they can be quite heavy. There are two things. They, they squeeze you down and they cut your feet off. You don't have any solid ground under your feet. Because so, oh baby, baby. <laughs> <laughs> See a little ball rolling around. It's like this. Grounded in the here and now. Past is gone. Future hasn't come. The thought of the future is taking me on a journey. It is as if I'm leaving the here and now and going into a mystical, magical future. I can't live there. That would be going, like going up in a rocket and opening the windows. Ain't no air up here. It's too thin. Future doesn't feed you. Only here and now. This is resourcing. Being here in this moment, sensation, sounds, this is... Can't grasp it but you find yourself moving with it. So over-invested is trying to bring the past back to life. In Tibetan culture, they have a, quite some attention to what are called rolangs. They are revived corpses. And at the time of Marpa and so on, there was quite a a sense that tantric masters could bring dead bodies back to life. Jesus did it. When these people come back to life, though, of course, they don't quite come back to life. They're sort of zombie. We are masters of zombies. We bring the past back to life. We bring the past into the present. Past is dead. It's gone. Oh, I remember when. <laughs> it's all B movies, the mummy gets up. <laughs> Take a walk down memory lane. No! <laughs> Very dangerous down there. Where are you going in the summer? You're going on holiday? Yes. <gasps> So some weird monster from the future, alien invasion from outer space. So between zombies and aliens, better stay here in the here and now. It's the only place where you're safe. That's what happens when you invest in these mm -hmm. mind forms. It is as if you're dealing with something substantial. You're making it substantial out of your belief. And then it collapses. How much energy do we put into projects, images, fantasies, startups, 
gets an idea to make a business and you do this and you do that and the preparations and the network and da 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 This is projection into the future. Overinvested. So what should I invest in? You invest excess. You can't invest if you don't have something to invest. So if you've got some extra money, you can invest it in the bank or shares or something. If you have extra presence, you could invest it in the past or the future. How do you quantify your presence? You invest thoughts which disguise your presence. You lose this, the actual, the here and now, for the sake of something over the stream in the next valley. That's the story of the prodigal son. He's at home, big landowning family, plenty of resources, nice horses, and he says, I'm out of here, Dad. Give me my share. And he takes it and he loses it and he comes back a beggar. Everything he needed was there, but he wanted something else. And he got lovely times and then he got shitty times. And then he had nothing but misery and hopelessness. And the interesting thing, of course, of the story in the Christian version is when he comes home, dad says, hooray. Brother says, well, fuck you. I've been working all the time. You've been out there wanking about. And Dad said, give him a break. Welcome. There's a place here for you. There's always a place in the here and now. This is where we live. This is our source. This is the ground. This is the Dharma Dhatu. This is where the triangles cross. This is... This is it. The rest is fantasy, speculation, empty ideas, empty thinking. So, how much of your life do you spend where you are? Plans, hopes, operating in dream time. Operating in dream time. Trying to make your dreams come true. Why? Here you are, breathing in and out. You are alive. You are here. Emptiness, manifesting a field of light with you moving inside it, connecting. The past is gone. You can't keep it. The future hasn't come. You can't eat it. You're here. That's the heart of the, the, the messages that are in all these texts. And they're very uh, useful. So yesterday we looked a little bit at the gaze and at sky gazing. If you, you really need a big expanse of blue to make it work well, otherwise bits of cloud will give you a, a point of fixation. So when you're with other people, <clears throat> there's all kind of social rules about eye contact and who's allowed to have eye contact. But if you make eye contact with someone who's open to you and you're open to them, the openness at a certain point starts to reveal some of the veils, some of the deflections because when thoughts arise, thin as they are, there's a kind of blockage. So if I'm open and gazing into your eye, and then I have a thought about you, my gaze is clouded. And if I'm thinking about something else, also my gaze is clouded. It's very rare to have full, open, empty space eye contact. <clears throat> you can see many photographs of Sialama. And his eye was like nobody's home. You just see this bright thing. He's 
he's not thinking about anything, just sitting there, especially when he was in his wheelchair, he said quite nicely, people pushing him about, and he's just looking for him. Nobody's there. He's not conceptualizing anything, and so he's available and receptive. That's an amazing thing to be able to do. So you can observe for yourself how you close down, because you are preoccupied. You don't have available space to offer someone. You're full of yourself, your concerns, your worries, your hopes, your fears. So if we take the Bodhisattva vow, I will help all beings. But actually, I don't have much time. <laughs> I'm a bit tired. Um, could we book it in for next week? <laughs> take a rain check reschedule because we don't have any space so if you take the bodhisattva vow you have to have wisdom wisdom dissolves preoccupation all your thoughts feelings memories and so on which seems so important it's just puff it's just shapes in the wind like lighting incense and watching the smoke drifting but if you hang on to that you are unavailable. You're unavailable to your own openness and you're unavailable to freely respond to other people. You may experience the power of being preformed. You may have a protocol that you're going to carry through, a legal protocol, a psychotherapy protocol, a surgical protocol, a pattern of how you should do it and how you will do it. And this preformation can be very useful because it could be refined from the uh, clinical experience of many people. However, you're not available. Availability is, let's see, let's see, what should we do? Let's see. The seeing determines the doing. If the doing is already preformed before the seeing, then this is like buying frozen meals from a supermarket. It's already cooked. Quick, easy, probably not very tasty, quite expensive, got a lot of not very good oil in it. If you're going to cook yourself, how do you cook quickly? How do you make it fresh? All the ingredients are fresh. They come to hand when the hand's empty. They come to mind when the mind's open and receptive. Fresh cooking is much quicker than taking something from the freezer and putting it in the oven. It's much quicker. That's an amazing thing to think. I need to prepare. Why do you need to prepare? Let's see how it goes. I don't know what happens in Germany, but in Britain, the government despises its own people. And this has been going on for a long time. The government decides that most school teachers are lazy and stupid and inefficient. So it brings together a national curriculum and teachers are reduced from educated people to paid, not very well paid functionaries that have to supply this preformed package very difficult then. <clears throat> How would you have dignity and self-respect when you're just taking it off the conveyor belt and handing it over? Where's the meeting? Where's the direct formation? And this is the same for many, many occupations. <laughs> freshness, one second, freshness is everything. In order to do that though, you have to have staff who are properly, uh, I was going to say trained, but that's not the issue, properly ripened been given the, uh, the permission to trust their developing experience and stand on their own feet and come out into the situation. When that's taken away from people, they're just cogs in a wheel. And it, it, the Mahamudra is describing an even deeper level than that. It's saying that uh, even if nobody else is forming your life, your karmic tendencies and your inner mental working is making pre-formations. Are they really in your best interest in terms of being 
awake and present? And are they really in the best interest of other people in terms of receiving their immediacy and responding? <clears throat> so this would always be saying, have the resources, resource yourself, find the pathways, but don't activate them. So when the texts are saying, don't rely on thoughts, it's meaning don't fill the space with patterns which are arising away from the moment. Thought, as we know, happens very, very quickly. If you connect, then the response will, will emerge because the connectivity is the basis for the intuitive, spontaneous response. So this is this uh, Indian word, sahaj, which means immediately full, just this. Uh, in, in Tibetan it's called lenchit chepa. Chepa means to be born or to arise, and lenchit means together. So you and this situation arising together and you're speaking or doing or responding. It's just like that, just like that. So that's the basis of the practice. Yeah, yeah, do you have a question? Um, so when you speak of uh, um, preparation or over-preparation, uh, I think of, you know, sometimes like, when I go to a meeting and it's like, it feels high stakes to me and then I go like, okay, I, I will do this and I, I, I prepare, I pre prepare the slides and uh, the more I, I prepare, um, I feel like I'm depriving me and others of, a, of an authentic conversation about the subject matter. And it never goes like I have intended. So in the aftermath, it feels like, okay, I was chasing, like I was a dog chasing his own tail, you know? And mm -hmm. I was, you know, as I think, as you said, I'm wasting my time on this over preparation thing. Um, so I, I feel like I, I get it to some degree. And, uh, and on the other hand, uh, like, you know, coming to this retreat, I, I had to schedule, we had to plan, like somebody had to build up this tent and mm -hmm. put things together like we make schedules for the for the kitchen and stuff mm -hmm. like that and uh, i think like you see you, you mentioned the notion of uh getting into contact with other people and interacting with other people that's that's i think that's 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 a um, beautiful notion but uh can you elaborate a little bit more on where to draw the line or, or when when you know where's a sign maybe to say okay like now i'm Again, a dog chasing his own tail, and now it's like just a natural interaction with other people. Okay, so the fact that people are coming to this retreat is one arising shape, if you like, like a wave coming out in the ocean. And then there's the knowledge of the people who are connected with this place, and they know people in the village who can come and help. They know uh, the place where you can rent a tent like this from. They know about getting food supplies. They know when the local shop is open and closed. So there's a coming together of lots of experience, experience of others, experience here. That's fairly concrete. That's not like the devil's tool of PowerPoint. <laughs> Power, PowerPoint is an insult to the audience because it's up on there and you've got to clue, you've got to get it, and then there's some little text underneath pre-digested food. I'm not a baby bird in a nest. <laughs> Get half a worm. It's an insane system because it's not a good way to convey information. You can, you can write it down, send it around to people before the meeting. You all paid a hell of a lot of money, so I take it that you've read the document. Let's proceed on that basis. And then you're into a discussion. But the idea that everybody has to be passive while this dull presentation proceeds in which your nose, you're like a bull in a field with a battle ring in its nose and you're being pulled by the rope of the presenter's uh, peculiar way of constructing a discourse. 
So I think there's a very big difference between if you start abstract and then you try to connect, or you start concrete. There are so many rooms available here. That the thing that I saw, you know, there's a list of bed and breakfasts or places where you can stay, small hotels around here, or you could put up a tent, and this gives people a choice. But you do have to inform us by this time so that we know what's going on. Please confirm your booking. I would say that that is invitational and connective without being uh, over-controlling, but it gives some kind of support whereby people can find their way. So I would say this is a very well-organized kind of event. Um, and then, of course, things have happened. Cooks have got COVID, and so new formations come in. And because there are people of goodwill here and people who have an understanding of the common weal, the common health, are able and willing and happy, it looks to me anyway, to participate and to respond. And so they have a different experience of collaboration, co-preparation, which of course is in many ways all part of the task. So that's, that's great. When these yogis were meeting for their uh, Gana Chakra, they didn't hire a chef. They would have had, as you see in India today, they would have two big logs and they'd run them together and the fire's going in between. They dig out a wee pit underneath, they put on potatoes and whatever. They wouldn't have had potatoes in those days. They hadn't arrived from South America. <laughs> Tomatoes, they wouldn't have had them. They might have had sweet potatoes there, probably. <laughs> I don't know. But they would have had something, maybe marrows, put them under, cook in about three, four hours, come out, eat together, make chapatis together. It's a, a collaborative thing in which everybody participates. Some of the happiest moments I had with my own teacher was when we would be traveling like in Sopema and we'd be in a little room and he would say, okay, tonight we have momos. Yes, so we get the flour and the water and borrow a bowl from someone in the village and make this up and then get a bunch of meat, chopping it with a sharp knife and a wooden block and then making these momos together, rolling them, getting them, putting them in the boiling water and so on. Everybody was engaged together. He was very good at folding the lip net. <laughs> it's so sweet. You're in it together. That kind of participation is like gold. Because it's based on the task, not on the hierarchy of role. And that's what we see with the kitchen. People say, what has to be done? How can I help? So there's no prepositioning in that. And I would imagine... When you engage in that, there is a kind of freedom mm -hmm. because you're born fresh into the actual shape of the task. Oh, can you peel this? Okay, so then your your elbows doing this kind of movement and turning, and now can you lift that? It's too heavy for me, and you go and do that. So that's a, that kind of collaboration, I would say, is very much moving in the direction of what this uh, unborn immediacy is like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What is that moment? Well, it's coming down, going across, <laughs> going through. <laughs> uh, just about uh, my experience of being in the present. Um, you know, when I listen to you or when I'm engaged in the kitchen, it feels quite easy to just be present with that as it unfolds. While I was thinking when I meditate, it sometimes feels like I'm trying to stay in the present and that feels like I'm dancing on the top of a needle of a pin and I could I slip off every time. So, um, you know, it just feel, if I feel engaged with unfolding or a story unfolding in my head, I feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm in it. Well, I don't know. I, I just wonder whether it's being too careful about engaging in meditation or what might happen, why it feels so hard to... Yeah. It almost feels like it should be static, and I know it shouldn't, but that's still what I'm after, so it feels like I'm <laughs> slipping off a lot. 
say something more about that? Uh, we have the field and we have the stalks coming up and then we have the flower. <laughs> you are not the ground, you are not the field, you are a flower. You can't put a kilo on top of a flower. It is not a burden carrying function. It's like that. If you think I have to do this, you can't. It's happening. I am not the doer or the maker. I am the experiencer of the unfolding. So it's the demand that I should make it happen. This is how it should be. This is, I've been reading the books and I've got a sense of how it should be. Then it's very difficult because if you are making something, it will be artifice, artificial. It will be art. You will be bringing together things according to some idea. So Dharmakaya is uncontrived, the uncontrived, beyond artifice, unconstructed ground, which is the openness of your mind, gives rise and you find this happening. So a thought arises, a dull, stupid thought. Where did it come from? From my bad karma factory. That's a thought. Dull, stupid thought meets interpretive, judgmental thought for a long and unhappy marriage. <laughs> Karmic dating agency. <laughs> so dull, stupid thought arises. Ground is open and empty. No other factory, no other source. It's empty. One ground, two paths. The path of seeing the ground or not seeing the ground. If I don't see the ground, I fabricate essences, existences, and on the basis of that, I'm here meditating, I've got to do it. I exist. What is the ground of existence? Delusion. If I see the actual ground, the unborn, this emergent moment is unborn. The reflection in the mirror is unborn. I'm trying too hard. I don't trust the generosity of the ground. Emptiness gives rise. So when we say with Prashaparamita, the mother of all the Buddhas, beings are born as Buddhas or reborn or unborn as Buddhas by being in the womb of the mother, which is emptiness. Buddhas come from emptiness. Buddhas are the ones who see emptiness and who are emptiness. Sentient beings are emptiness but don't see their emptiness. And that obscuration thickens the plane and gives rise to the sense, well, I'm me and I have to do it and it's bloody difficult and I don't know how to do it. Maybe everyone else does and so on. All these thoughts rise. So, releasing the R gets a little bit thinner. There's still these thickening layers, background shadows. How to get rid of them? Don't get rid of them. They're there. What are they? If your mind doesn't move, they will move. <laughs> if you move because you think, I need to get rid of them, or I need to do something, they will stay. That's all. That's all that these guys are saying. Trust, relax, open, perfect from the very beginning. Mahamudra, the great circle, complete, sealed by all the Buddhas. Sealed, don't change the royal document. Don't make a forgery. Don't make it false. It is what it is. Everything which arises is non-dual with the ground no matter how it appears. All diversity is within the whole. That short thing that the cuckoo's crying is saying that. So all of samsara and all of nirvana is inside the whole. 
we have a preference as an ego self has a preference for the bright and shiny the wholesome the one that seems valid the one that you would be happy for your friends to know about and we have an aversion to the more troubled and difficult that we don't want people to know about that we can't or it's dull or it's stupid so we start with a, a divisive bias what I'm attached to, what I'm not attached to, what I'm fearful of, and I want to get rid of. From that position is never going to work well, because it's divided. The whole is not divided, but all fantasies of division are in the whole. That's the Mahamudra. So when you find yourself in strongly polarized thinking, hating someone or longing for someone, in that situation, it is what it is. What is it? Let's see. <laughs> if you import a conclusion on the basis of your prior conceptualization, then it's difficult. That's why in some of these, if you look through the text here, you find that <clears throat> some of these uh, yogis are quite insulting towards scholars. Because scholarship and study fills your mind with things. So you study the ten bodhisattva bhumis and you have to progress through these. Or in the Ther Theravadan system you've got the jhanas, the different stages of meditative absorption. And if you don't go up these in the proper way, you'll be on the wrong path. So somebody says, the map is the truth. Don't trust the territory. The territory will lead you astray. You're not as intelligent as you think you are. The big, intelligent, bright people, they drew these maps. Follow the map. Follow the GPS to get lost. <laughs> <laughs> Into the Rhine. <laughs> this is the whole issue. Map or territory. Territory is unpredictable. It's unfolding. It's being revealed. Map is abstract and seems to endure through time. So when you study and you memorize and internalize these maps, what, what do you do with the vagaries, the unpredictabilities, the uncertainties, the shocks, surprises, accidents of emergent territory? That's the difficulty. The map must be right. It's all saying, let go of the map. The map's a kind of training exercise. You know, London's full of these huge, big, beefy guys, and they're walking around in the summer on the streets, fucking. Have you ever painted an old granny's wall for her? Have you taken out her bloody rubbish? Have you been to the shops and carried it back? No, you're a lump of meat. Fucking useless. <laughs> Six pack. <laughs> useless nonsense so a lot of academic study is like that it's shiny and bright you get your PhD but you can't even open a door <laughs> so you have to observe for yourself lock, key, fit the lock keeps changing it's like Hogwarts <laughs> everything's moving around you've got to be there and get through the door while it's open, which is phenomena, which is being here and now, being present. Don't go abstract. Don't bring in expectations. Be relaxed, open, and make these micro moves, finding your way into ever more attuned proximity to the arising moment. Okay, one last thought then. <clears throat> but isn't the learning the view some kind of learning a map somehow? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so how does this map relate to the terrain? Well, this this is a map that says, uh, look at the terrain. Things like paint. Let's have a break. <laughs>
Do we have different texts here and the different authors give different flavors in the presentation? And this is necessarily the case. Although we say the view, as we know, there is no stabilized concrete entity at all. What we have is viewing and these uh, yogis present what they saw when viewing according to the view. The Dharma and the here and now is like a sculpture. It appears differently from different positions. As we move around it in the course of our lives, we see different aspects, but also we see one particular aspect and someone positioned differently will see other aspects. It's not dogma. With dogma, people try to say, this is the one holy truth and you have to see it in the right way, otherwise you are a heretic. It's not a thing to be seen. You cannot see Mahamudra, you cannot find Mahamudra, you cannot live and lose Mahamudra because <coughs> Mahamudra is the ground and the field and the particularization of yourself. You are all, always already within Mahamudra. And so the experience of it is diverse and multiple but it itself is simple and singular. As the text says, if you go to a land of gold, all you find is gold. So, according to the teachings, we go to the land of emptiness. We are in the land of emptiness. Everything you find is empty. So we have awareness and emptiness, clarity and emptiness, appearance and emptiness, joy and emptiness, chocolate and emptiness, carrots and emptiness, everything is inseparable from emptiness. Emptiness is the ground which shows diverse forms. So, there is one ground, but we have diverse obscurations. These obscurations are made of gold. They are made of emptiness. If you see the emptiness of your obscurations, then you don't have obscuration. If you believe in the truth, the real existence of yourself and of your obscurations, then you have a lot of work to do. So that's why they always point to the non-duality of every form of experience from it's all non-dual with the ground. If you see it, you're a Buddha. If you don't see it, you're a sentient being. But between Buddhas and sentient beings, there is no difference. Of course there is a difference, but there is no difference. Mm. It's just like that. Nam Kainobu used to tell this story that when he was studying a sutra with his, one of his teachers, and in this sutra is talking about the qualities of the Buddha, the qualities of the Guru, and how everything about the, the Guru is made of light, and even their shit smells of roses. So, Norbu being a very intelligent boy, he went out after his teacher had gone to the toilet, the <laughs> stick he's poking around in his poo, which, oh, smells like shit. <laughs> it's like that. Guru, Buddha, ordinary person, same, same. What's the difference? Interpretation. Some people say this teacher is wonderful. Other people say he's a fraud and a sham. <coughs> it depends. They say if you believe the Guru is a Buddha, you get the blessing of a Buddha. If you believe the Guru is a cheat, you get the blessing of a cheat. It's not real. It's imagined. Imagination is not nothing at all, it's emptiness and imagination, and the forms that arise in imagination have some impact, like the theatre or the movies. Subtle, mm -hmm. subtle. 
So we have to keep looking again and again. Okay, so we continue with the text. We're going to look at one by Tilopa, which in the book is on page 31. Tilopa, there's a, if you have the book, there's a nice picture of him uh, grinding the sesame seeds. His name is uh, Til, Tilopa. Til means oil or sesame oil. Uh, now it's a kind of generalized word for, for oil in North Indian languages. So you have Mitika Til, which is uh, kerosene. So he worked in a very ordinary way, a very poor day laborer's job, crushing the, the sesame seed to make oil. When Naropa, his disciple, finds him, he's eating uh, rejected fish thrown on the bank by the fishermen. He didn't have high aspirations. So he's a fairly low caste, outcast kind of person. If you always live in a village and you never leave the village, you have a particular understanding of the village. But if you even walk one kilometer outside the village and turn and look, you say, oh, that big, big village I lived in is quite small. And it's situated below the mountain beside the river. So if you're an outcast on the outside, <clears throat> you see the world more clearly. When you live inside society, you're pulled into believing in the importance of property, of careers, <laughs> social status, social identification. <laughs> and these formations seem to have truth. When you look from the outside, you say, oh, these are constructs. Belief is the demon's magic that makes constructs look intrinsic. So, when the Buddha was first teaching, he was advising people to take the path of renunciation. Because that is a way of getting an outsider status. But of course, after some hundred years, hundreds of years, being a monk in a monastery, which is where Naropa had been, was a very, very uh, proper, socially acceptable behavior. These big monasteries like Nalanda, they had 20,000 monks. They had all kinds of departments for philosophy. They had specialist teachers and so on. So that was a world that was established and full of conventions. Someone like uh, Tilopa is way out there. So when Naropa gets this message, one day he's sitting in his room, he's studying his books, and this old, I mean, there are different versions of this story, but what, this old woman comes and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm studying the Dharma. And do you understand anything? He said, of course I am, I'm the teacher here. Are you sure you understand something? <laughs> and she keeps looking at him, and he starts to feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> what have you understood? And he starts to tell, no, 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 but what have you understood? And again, he starts to tell her something. You haven't understood anything, you're just giving me words and concepts. You don't know anything. And then he asks her, who are you? Why are you here? She said, oh, you should go and see my brother, Tilopa. So he sets off. So he is already disrupted from his world. He was on the inside, high, big, big, famous professor, one of the door guardians. They had four big doors on the monastery, and he would protect it if Hindus or what they call Turtikas, people who debated about philosophy, came he would always have to be able to demonstrate the superiority of Buddhist understanding. But he leaves that because he realizes something is missing. 
and after some difficult journeys, he finds Tilopa, and Tilopa is not really what he imagined he would find. Tilopa is not a scholar, he's a poor man, but he is more awake than Naropa. Naropa has all the clothes, and Tilopa is happy to be naked. And Naropa realizes, all these clothes I have are hiding my nakedness, and then Tilopa sets in the famous 12 tasks and so on that allow him to unwrap himself from his conceptual wrapping. So Tilopa in the Kajupa lineage is a very, very important figure because according to the tradition, it goes from Dorji Chang to Tilopa. And, uh, Tilopa is the kind of manifestation into the world of the unmediated, unproduced, direct awakening of Dochi Chang. So here he has a, quite a short teaching. He says, begins, uh, I pay homage to Sri Vajrasattva. Vajrasattva, the indestructible being. Indestructible being means the three kayas or the inseparability of presence from the ground. I pay homage to the unchanging intrinsic awareness, Mahamudra. Mahamudra is not different from your own mind, which is unchanging because it is intrinsic awareness. It is the awareness which is at the heart of all beings, but is obscured for them by their own attempt to make sense of life and experience by relying on concepts. All concepts are inseparable from intrinsic awareness. They move through intrinsic awareness like clouds in the sky or reflections in a mirror. When you don't see the mirror, all you have is the reflection, and you stabilize the reflection by believing it's real. So if you awaken to your intrinsic awareness, then the delusion of the separate uh, existence of these uh, reflections dissolves. So the text has two parts, extensive teaching and brief teaching. There are four parts to this uh, first extensive teaching. Firstly, presenting the view. So he says the five aggregates, the 18 factors of experience and the 12 aspects of the sense fields, without exception, they all arise from and dissolve within the nature of Mahamudra. So these categories are very important. They're mentioned also in the Heart Sutra, where he says uh, they are inseparable from emptiness. So he's saying the same thing but formulating it slightly differently. Remember, this is a sculpture. Walk around the sculpture, you get a slightly different view. You can't grasp a sculpture. All you have is the view from here. So the view of the Heart Sutra was formulated many hundreds of years before this view. So this is, this is a more um, intense and direct presentation. The five aggregates are the five skandhas, form, which is shape and color, sensation, positive, neutral and negative, perception, which is uh, the knowledge which is shaping. So. When you look outside and you see different kinds of trees, you have a perception. You feel, I see what is there. The Tibetan term for this is um, du she. Shepa means to know, and du means to gather. So what's being gathered is the simplicity of the visual perception and the concept of tree, the concept of green, the concept of height, the concept of time of day, illumination, and so on. All these 
concepts arrive in a very, very subtle way. They immediately join together in the seeming intrinsic experience, or no, in the seem in the experience of the seeming inherent treeness of the tree. The tree is a tree. We don't see that perception is a process. So then we have this, if you like, dense perception, which is happening for the five senses. So we have the five uh, senses are giving this information and it's being pulled together in the next one, which is this uh, composition uh, shaping fabrication it's called the doing chepa to do of shaping the shaping so now you're getting more density and more thickness as your associations are your personal associations are being massaged into what you perceived so you might see a tree and you think oh my grandmother had a tree like that in her garden. I remember climbing that tree. So that's got nothing to do with the tree in front of you. But that now gives you this absolute sense of being personally connected with the tree. And it is as if the fact that a similar tree grew in your grandmother's garden has brought uh, an added value into this tree for you. And then the fifth skanda is consciousness. As we touched on, there's the consciousness of the five senses. There's the organizing mental consciousness. Then there's the consciousness of the inflection of the five poisons in which I see the tree because I remember it from my grandmother's garden. I love that tree. I love that kind of tree. I just had such a good time climbing it and playing in it. So the uh, affliction or the uh, emotional coloration of desire becomes evoked in relation to the tree. And then the eighth consciousness is the consciousness which holds the potential of all things. Not the potential of everything in samsara, but the potential of all reified entities. So it's the ground of everything. So, so in the in the I should say though, the five skandhas mainly occur in the Theravadan tradition, and in the Theravadan tradition, they're only concerned with the first six consciousnesses. The other two become more developed in the Mahayana tradition. So these five factors operate together as the flowing and merging and co-creating elements of our experience of ourselves. So in the Theravada tradition they say uh, there are no persons, Pudgala, Pudgala Anat Madrishti. The view of the absence of inherent self in people. So when you see that you are composed of these five skandhas and all sentient beings are composed of these five skandhas, then when you're looking at someone, the bit of you that wants to apprehend them, oh, I've, I've met you before, that there's somebody there, somebody who is knowable, graspable, definable, in a sense, reducible to my definition, I can squeeze them into my sense of them, that's delusion. They are the manifesting of the dynamic interaction of these five skandhas. The, the picture is created just like in an old cinema. You've got the celluloid strips with the pictures on them. You've got the projector. <coughs> You've got the wire from the projector going into the source of electricity. You've got the screen. These factors operate together. Ah, 
and it's the movie and you're in the movie and you're captivated by the movie but if the electricity supply stops there's no movie so you have to have these five aspects moving together to generate the illusion of autonomous individuals standing in their own ground that is an illusion and when we strongly believe in it, it's, it's a delusion. We become stupid, we become, de we become deranged. Well, of course, we say things like, uh, did you sleep okay? How are you today? Have you got plans for the summer? We, we accept that the people in front of us are going to have lives which are not just their moment with us. We, we allow them the fact that they have di diverse experiences and so on, that they're reacting according to circumstances. How do you find the food here? Is it okay? Is that the sort of thing you eat at home? You might ask someone that question. So there is the sense that you don't quite know them, but the basic feeling is, well, I may not know everything about you, but I do know that you exist. So the, the understanding of the five scanners, uh, 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 they don't exist. You have fabricated the delusion of their existence so that even although you're quite at home with them having varied kinds of experiences and doing many different things in life, somehow these are all variations on a theme. You, you listen to the Goldberg variations and, you know, all these things that Bach can do with a few notes and move them up and down and all around. So we think, oh yes, Mary's in a good mood today or Mary's in a shitty mood today. But Mary is Mary. Ah, we all know Mary. Of course, you don't know Mary because shitty Mary and happy Mary is not the same Mary. Functionally, it's not the same. What you can say to Mary on a good day when she's smiling and available you cannot say when Mary's not available. You just cannot do it. That's why if you spend some time with uh, people who are described as autistic, they're extremely good at saying, keep your assumptions to yourself. They will not be gathered into your definite predictive knowledge because their moods are shifting and moving quite intensively and they can be just on a sixpence, a loud noise, and suddenly, yeah, appearing in a very different way. You're faster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was wondering, uh, in the Theravada tradition, but also in the Mayan or anywhere, where, where does awareness fit onto the five well, it doesn't. It doesn't so, fit so into the Theravada. What today? they have is mindfulness. They have sati, uh, which in Tibetan is uh, dremba. So, my, so you have the four foundations of mindfulness: of the mind and so on, the body. If you're being mindful of, thank you. You're being mindful of the body. The function of that is not to tell the body what it is, not to sit in a conclusion that you have about your body, but a bit like the Vipassana, to allow the body to announce itself dynamically moment by moment. So that mindfulness dissolves the sense of... The, oh, it's getting close. The other wedding, 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 because the other cars are good. Oh, oh, oh. Kind of wedding, wedding. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, first. <laughs> so, there we have a lovely example. Two people, special day, happy to be married. Shall we interview them in two years' time? <laughs> <laughs> so in that sense, when you do mindfulness, like in the Vipassana body scanning and, and the various uh, approaches that they have, you see that the solidity, the consolidation, which seems to support your conclusion about someone, is unreliable. 
because actually they are a flow of experiences, interconnected, dependent origination, but unpredictable in precise patterning. So, but that, if the Putgala, the, it, it's not the complete person then, is it? If, if mindfulness or awareness is to be found somewhere. Well, mindfulness is a quality of consciousness. So it's, it's sort of... So your mental, your mental consciousness in being mindful of your sense organs as they function and what's arising in the sense organs is avoiding resting on preformed conclusions. Yeah, but it doesn't work with awareness the same way then, does it? No, no, awareness is something completely different. It, well, if you talk with a, a Thai monk who was a meditator in the forest tradition in Thailand, they would probably want to fight about that. But from a Tibetan point of view, they're not into awareness at all because they have a focus. So these highest jhanas where there is pure consciousness with no object. For Mahmud and Sokhshin, they would say that's, that's a holiday home. So when we look at the six realms of samsara, the, the sensuous god realm, the simple God realm, and then you have these levels, eight levels of uh, consciousness, which go consciousness with some traces, some sense of body, four consciousnesses where there's less and less <clears throat> sense of anything there, and to, to just a kind of conscious, which is just conscious of itself, but it doesn't have insight into the emptiness of the consciousness. And you stay in that for a while, and then you fall down into some other realm, samsara. So that's radically different, then, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> it's very radically different. But in the Mahayana, hear you. Sorry. So sorry, but because when you have the Heart Sutra, you 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 get you know Avalokiteshvara questions Heart Sutra. So does that is that like a bridge? Or is that still part of... Um, yeah, no, it, yeah, Shariputra them? asked the question, Avalokiteshvara yeah. replies, yeah, he's yeah, the yeah. boss guy. He's saying, you Hinayana people need to learn from us. You don't know. You think you know, but you know. It's all empty. That's a different level. I don't want to mix no, that too much with what he's saying here. So this is the... Having a sense, it's essentially it's a critique that you exist as as a as a something, that you are an entity, a self entity, which can be known. Then he's talking about these eighteen factors of experience. So these are with the six senses, and they say the mind is the sixth sense. This mind is the mind which utilizes concepts. It's, it's called uh, manas in Sanskrit or yid in Tibetan. And so you have the objects of the six consciousnesses. So the object of mental consciousness is the formulations produced by the five sense consciousnesses. Then you have the organ of the six senses. So we have eyes and ears and so on. And the organ of mental consciousness is the heart. It's located in the heart. And then you have the consciousness itself, which is the illuminative power which reveals the sense data which is coming in. So these 18 datus, they're called. Uh, datu can mean a kind of dim dimension or arena, like the Dharma datu. So these are the uh, domains of sensory experience. So he's, he's just listing these and the 12 aspects of the sense field, which is the objects and the senses, not listing the consciousnesses. So there's just 12 of them. So he's saying these very accepted three uh, categories which are held to encompass and define the human experience and are taken as irreducible as a kind of basic matrix 
you can reduce everything or, or bring everything into these 18 or 12 or 5 and they appear to be the kind of bottom line. This is, this is what's generating all this experience moment by moment. He's saying, without ex exception, they all arise from and dissolve within the nature of Mahamudra. So Mahamudra is the unborn openness, it's emptiness inseparable from awareness. So what he's saying is that these are not entities, they are experiences. They also are dynamic. So it's not that there are 18 factors which generate experience, but these 18 factors are also experience. Mm -hmm. That is to say, if you are here, present, in the here and now, everything is here. You know, it's, it's like a warning. The more you think about these things, the more you divide them up, you get taken away from the integrity. So, uh, all divisions are dangerous because they provide fault lines. So, in many European countries, you have the regular citizens and the gypsies. Gypsies have been there a long, long time. But are they really one of us? So when difficulties come, right-wing governments come in, always looking a bit suspiciously at the gypsies. Not really one of us, not integral, but somehow a foreign element which has been here a long time. And so they can get killed off or persecuted or raped or locked in prison very easily. So, differentiation, which doesn't say all of us together on an outer level, provides fault lines for inclusion, exclusion. And similarly, the more you have these kind of concepts, then you say, this is not that. So, form as color and shape is not the same as sensation. Form is dealing with appearances in the world and sensation is dealing with mental experience. All of these formulations seem to be addressing different items, different entities. He said all of this is inseparable from the unborn presence, which is Mahamudra. And that if you build your world on the basis of these pseudo-entities, you're simply deluding yourself and deluding other people. So this is a kind of roundabout way also of critiquing all mental analysis, all judgments. So when uh, a few hundred years ago, there was the first development of microscopes and people go look down the microscope and they bring some water from a muddy pond and they look in and think, wow, all these little things moving about inside. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen these before. We need to name them. Let's name them in Latin because that will be <laughs> establish our credentials. And so you get more and more analysis and that goes all the way down with the DNA and all the rest of it, sequences being named. And as soon as you put in the name, the nominative, it, it establishes a pseudo entity. Even if the people who are looking and thinking about these things have a sense of the dynamic nature of them, it is as if they exist. Mm -hmm. So, my liver, doctor, I'm worried about my liver, I'm getting these pains. But of course, the, the liver is an integral part of the body. It's plugged into blood and so on. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be any use to you. It would be a rotting thing inside your body. So although you say liver, actually it's an, it's an integrated system of communication. This is a systemic movement of parts which stand in relation to each other. And to say the heart and the lungs, that's fine for a corpse. But for a living person, it, it doesn't have too much truth because these fun, these aspects or whatever we call them, these bits, they're not really bits, 
the the sites function in their interactive communication. Problems arise when you get blockages of communication. So you get the uh, build-up of sediment in the, in, the, in the arteries and veins, and then the blood supply goes down and various symptoms arise from that. The body works best as free flow communication. So we don't really have a verbal language to describe things in terms of dynamic interaction it takes you into weird formulations. I mean, some of the people who are working around surrealism and uh, stream of consciousness writing were trying to do that. But when you read it, you get a bit of a headache because actually language has nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs and a sentence should have a, a kind of a shape and a density and you know where you are with it. So if it's just a stream of consciousness, it's like, wow. Well, but actually our life is a stream of consciousness. The problem with stream of consciousness is so quick that our dualistic consciousness can't make sense of it. Slow down a bit, you're going too fast. Let me think about what you were saying. So you're trying to find a pattern with it. So he, what he's saying is the effort, the quite understandable efforts that people have made to make sense of what these constituents are. There's some gains because you get a kind of clarity, but it's also a reification which disguises the interactive dynamic nature. So that's that's really the beginning of Mahamudra, turning away from stability, building blocks, construction to immediacy. So he says, the substantial and the insubstantial are both beyond conceptualization. So the substantial, we know that's tables, statues, flowers, things which seem to have some substance. They, they take up space, they displace other things. They have to be allowed a territory in which they are present. So if you have a handbag or a book, they take up space and the space that they occupy obscures the, the space of the basic carpet that's on the floor. So the placing is an alteration of the field of experience. It displaces something else from the line of view or smell or sight or whatever. And the insubstantial is things like yesterday. So we can talk about yesterday as if such a thing existed, but there isn't. It's completely insubstantial. It's just a construct. America. America for me is an insubstantial construct. I have no desire to go there, no wish to go there. Hopefully I will not go there. Um, and so for me it's just a name, just an idea. Even if I went there, I would be arriving in just another land of ideas. Welcome to New York. Oh, but I thought this was the airport. Oh, it's New York airport. Okay. Is there another New York? Oh, yeah, go in there. Which is the best bit of New York? Well, that depends. I'm from Brooklyn. I like it there. There is no New York. It's just sequence of sensory experience and concepts. So that's, if you really look, everything is insubstantial. But we seem to think there's some insubstantial and more substantial things. Both are beyond conceptualization because they are concepts. Their seeming truth for us is our conceptualization of them, but the actuality is beyond conceptualization. So there you are in New York. Am I in New York? Yes. Is, but this street's not the same as that street. Oh, we've got a lot of New Yorks. So what's the real New York, the best New York? Are you sure this is New York? You get more and more concept. It's a concept. The actuality of this street at this moment with these people and these cars going by, 
you can't conceptualize it. It is a complex, multidimensional emergence inseparable from emptiness. So he's saying, this is a, he's starting to indicate everything is your mind. If you see everything is an experience, although you can categorize some as fantasy and some as reality, they're all experiences. So then he says, there is nothing for mentation to do. There's nothing for mental activity to do because your mental activity cannot catch this. So this is really something to investigate. Go outside, look at the cars, look at the trees, develop your concepts about them. Have your concepts actually caught what is there? Do your concepts bring you to something real or are they retroflexive? Do they go back onto you? You develop the concept and the concept illuminates the world for you so that you're swirling round and round in projecting the meaning of your concept, introjecting the meaning of your concept, but not actually arising at something. That's what he's indicating. So that's, he's not setting this out in exercises, but that's the implication here. Check it out for yourself. Don't believe Tilopa. Look and see. Do concepts reveal the actual? You can put lots and lots of labels on it. So go back to the image of the sculpture. The sculpture, looked at from different points of view, shows different formations. What is the true sculpture? There isn't a true sculpture. The sculpture is a potential revealed in relatedness, and what's revealed is truly what's there, but what's there as revealed to this point of viewing. Yeah. You can't get the whole because the whole is beyond the positioning of the part. The whole is not the sum of its parts. It cannot be totalized. The part is always within the whole. That makes sense? Yeah. So we need to look again and again because we are deluded by our own experienced and sophisticated use of language, which language is the vehicle of reification. It solidifies. It solidifies that which is moving and changing. So he's saying there's nothing for this mental activity to do and no meaning to be sought. This is where we are all fundamentally grateful to Pablo Picasso. <laughs> you look at the painting, what does it mean? Whatever you like. What does it mean? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Who can tell you the truth about the painting? Because of Picasso's kindness, hundreds of people have done their BA and their MA and their PhD in art history and now have jobs in universities, getting pay at the end of the month, feeding their children, going on holiday. Because if the paintings of Picasso were completely clear, you had nothing to say. You have different opinions, different interpretations. You cannot get the truth of Picasso or Rembrandt or P Pissarro or Cezanne, any artist, is beyond grasping. You see, you feel like this today according to these circumstances. You project your interpretation onto the painting, but that's not the painting. You receive the painting, shtum, can't say a bloody thing. You look at it in terms of your frame of reference and you can say a lot about it. So this is the key thing. Be a, become a conscious of the kind of mental interpretive form you have. That's why modern art is incredibly useful. 
and the uproar that came in Paris, you know, when the, there was the first showing of, of the modern paintings, what, about 1860, and people were saying, well, that's not art. That doesn't belong here. We don't, what, what the hell is that? The same with the uproar when the Stravinsky's Rite of Spring came into Paris in the 1910s. People say, what the fuck, what is that? People were shouting and screaming. And gradually you get used to it. Oh, I recognize it. And so we've had all these interventions in modern culture where there's been confusion at first, like watching a, a Beckett play. What rubbish. And then they read a review by some learned person. This is amazing, profound contribution to the human development. <laughs> go back and oh, yes, I. <laughs> you don't get it at first, but you know, it's. <laughs> And we will formulate and elaborate some kind of conclusion. And that's what we're doing. Our creativity is set in motion by the, the music or the play or the painting, but it doesn't catch it. All of these things are uncatchable. And then if you take that out into the world, to the things that seem to have a more formal logic to them, the architecture of the art gallery, and there's a kind of... Okay, at least this is stable. That may be weird and wonderfully weird, but I wouldn't want the building to be wonderfully weird. And then you get the Guggenheim in Bilbao and you think, okay, that's pretty weird, but interestingly weird. <laughs> but there's certain kinds of disturbance which are, are just shocking. <laughs> so that's what we do. Ooh. It's a discordance, it's a clash. And that's, you know, the shock of the new. There's lots of writing about these things. How do you shake yourself out of this dumpling <laughs> existence? <laughs> it's summer. We don't eat dumplings in summertime. Winter is good. But dumplings all year round, that would be a bit much. <laughs> So that's what, that's what he's inviting us to say, is don't fall asleep on the job. It's very tempting, and there's whole swathes of human culture and interaction which depend on talking of your convention, through your conventional categories as if they had a true referent and they were pointing at something. But actually you can't find the thing pointed to. It's the finger's not pointing at the moon, the finger's pointing at the sky. You can't grasp the sky. So then he says, as all things are constitutionally false and deceptive, beginning and ending are discarded. Constitutionally, inherently, intrinsically, out of themselves, whatever you see is false and deceptive. Deceptive means the truth that you see in the object is a truth you have projected into the object. So it is a, it's like a coat hanger. And you keep talking about the coat hanger as if it was a coat. So Magritte says, this is not a pipe. Mm -hmm. It's a pipe. This is not a pipe. Mm -hmm. okay. well, what's it's a painting there? What, what, what's it about? What's a pipe? No, it's not a pipe. It's a painting. It's an image. It's an illusion. It's a representation. It's not a pipe. You can't smoke it. It's not a pipe. But it is a pipe. That's art. That's why human culture is incredibly useful. You see how you want to cheat yourselves. As we talked yesterday, you go to the movies, you want to be misled by the movie. These are actors, people who are paid money to pretend to be somebody they're not. And we want to be misled into believing in the truth of a story that somebody has written. So that's, that's our tendency. And if you see that through culture and you extend that, you extrapolate that out, you start thinking, oh, well, I'm doing this all the time. I am fabricating the seeming substance of everything I see. Oh. 
And if I'm doing it, I don't need to do it. And if I don't do it, how will it be? <coughs> That'll be Mahamudra. If you stop deceiving yourself, that's Mahamudra. If you continue to deceive yourself, that will be samsara. I don't think I'm deluding myself. That's samsara. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, because of this, beginning and ending are discarded. So, we're in this room. Look at someone. You might have to look at the back of their head, but look at someone. Can you see them? Can you see them? Do you see someone? No. <laughs> what you see is a field of appearance. Relax your gaze. Panoramic vision. Open your gaze. You see the whole shebang. No? Then you focus on someone and they seem to be figural. They're being taken out of the field of appearance. They haven't moved, you haven't touched them, but somehow they're becoming stronger and more real the more attention you give them and everything else goes into the background. So when you look at someone, the beginning of their someoneness is the quality of your gaze. You are the creator of the other person. They are present in the field of uncreation. They are unborn. They are a potential moving in a field of potential. The potential is potentiated, is, is energized by your selective attention and your investment of interpretation and meaning into the person. Does that make sense? Does that seem to be the case? I have to say, I'm not a great fan of these two ugly little dogs. <coughs> Clearly, some people like these two, let me say it again, ugly little dogs, <laughs> wandering around with their arseholes on display. Could she not give them a wee dress or something? Please, I'm having my dinner, go on. But some people like them. <laughs> because they project a different set of associations from me. Everything is interpretation. And the movement of the interpretation of the mind is seamless. It's just moving. And the field of perception is also seamless. But... When the conceptualization arises, you come to a conclusion. You say, these dogs are dot, 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 gorgeous, lovely, they're so interesting. Maybe I'll get dogs like that. <laughs> Lee, who was here, was absolutely fascinated by these dogs. And he really enjoyed the idea that they have these kind of harnesses around them. You can lift them up. <laughs> they're really good kind of dog and they don't bite. <laughs> We all engage with things through this medium, we interpret, we go forward or back. There is no beginning and end to that. These dogs came into being differently for different people. No? Not the same dogs. The dog itself, you could say, well, there's a lady here who is the owner of the dogs. She spent more time with them, done more things with them. She really knows them. She knows them as her, her dogs. We know them in a different way. We see different aspects of the dog. What is the truth about the dog? Can't say. The dog has no beginning or end. The dog is part of the field which is open to interpretation. The dogs are potential. We are each potential. Our potential is revealed differently according to each of us participation. As I participate, I change. And that changing will be part of the field of experience for you as you participate. So this is a very complex, multi-modular 
interactive field without beginning or end. And yet, if we are going to talk about it, if we are going to conceptualize it, we slice it up, we formulate entities, and we act as if these entities had real existence. If you know that the fabrication of entities is an imaginal act, it is as if there are real separate people, then you know, oh, this is the theater of my mind. But if you truly believe objectively out there, other than myself, there are real people who are like this and that, the field is fragmented. You've taken the mirror and dropped it, and these shards are there at funny angles reflecting all sorts of bits and pieces. So in the Indian tradition, when uh, Shiva marries Parvati, her dad is not very pleased and never liked the son-in-law. Uh, he doesn't think he treats Parvati very well. He's always meditating and smoking ganja. And uh, she should have had a better kind of man and something wrong with him. So they have this disabled child. And then she dies. And she, but Shiva loves Parvati, picks her up, and he's dancing around, dancing around. And he won't let go. And her dad is really angry, but he can't stop Shiva because she's looking pretty wild. Gradually, bits of her are falling off her head, her hands, her heart, her vagina, fall in different parts of India. Eight major cemeteries arise from the main parts, and minor cemeteries and pilgrimage places arise from the other parts. The fragmented goddess, you have the same in the Egyptian structure as well with the, the murdered god. That is to say, the world can fragment. The integration with these cross triangles, in a sense, that's uh, Shiva and Shakti, Shiva and Parvati. They are inseparable. They are together. The, the, when you go in an Indian Shiva temple, you see the uh, it's a base, which is the, the yoni, the vagina, with the lingam in it. The, the inseparability of these two things cannot be apart. Everything is joined. That's a, you see, this is an unfragmented world, but the death of the goddess, the fragmentation of the body, is like, well, this is samsara. It's all over the place. So you have to go to pilgrimage here and pilgrimage there and pilgrimage there. It's not all in one place. So that's a, a kind of symbolic way of thinking about the structure of samsara. Actually, everything is in one place. Where is Parvati, she is in Shiva's heart. Where is Shiva? He is in your heart, if you're into that kind of symbolism. But we, through our conceptualization, we have the hammer and we shatter the mirror again and again. Do you wake up in the morning? Intact. Diversity in reflection, non-dual. Then you start thinking, planning the day, worrying about something, smash, smash, smash. Then the mirror is broken into smaller and smaller pieces. No wonder at the end of the day you're very tired because you've been jumping from this to that to that to that to that. One. Each of these has been part of the whole. <laughs> Diversity is the face of the whole. The face is whole, one face, one nose. Nose, ears. Nose is not the same as the ear, the ear is not the same as the nose. Smiley face, grumpy face, not the same face. It is the same face. No, it's not. <laughs> Different faces, one face. That's it, yeah, that's it. The diversity is the same. These are modes of the same. It is unsplit, non-dual, yet rich and complex. Oh, that's what he's alluding to here. 
20 minutes to lunch and counting. <laughs> Whatever becomes an object for consider of consideration for mentation is not actually how it is, being a subjective naming. Now, this is very, very, very helpful. Objective consideration. We look around, we see different people, we see the kind of clothes they're wearing, we see the expressions they have. These are objects of consideration for our mentation. That is to say, you can look at someone and you can think about them, you can come to certain conclusions. This kind of perception is not actually how it is. You think this is how it is, you're sure this is how it is, you have confidence that you're not deaf, dumb and blind and you're not stupid. I can see you, I can see you, I'll get a sense of you. But he says it's not how it actually is because it is a subjective naming. What you see is subjective naming. It is the view from here and the view from here reveals the view from here. It doesn't reveal what's there, it reveals the view from here. You have access, <coughs> you have access to experience, your experience, you don't have access to the thing itself. This thing itself is beyond conceptualization. In fact, you could say there isn't a thing itself, but you don't even need to go that far. Everything is your experience. The blessing of this is the quality of your experience depends on you. So that's why we have all these preliminary practices to do it. You can purify your thoughts, you can do doji sen, but if you realize I am a dull, stupid, aggressive person, you can gradually purify that. You can do the purification, see what the obscurations are, see how you're holding on to resentment about your dad or whatever that makes you angry and dissatisfied and competitive. I am putting my lifeblood into maintaining this construct, this reading of the world, as I continue to fight the ghosts of my dad. Why? So you do your dodgy semper and you let go of that and you let go of that. I am crystal, I am shining, I am empty, I am radiant. Dad's gone, mom's gone, I'm gone, only this. You can do that, but he's saying we don't actually have to do that because all your constructs have been empty. So whether your construct tastes sweet or tastes bitter, if you know that it's an empty construct, <clears throat> that's all it is. So you look in the mirror, you see a reflection, <clears throat> horrible. There's nothing horrible there. It's a reflection. You go to a horror movie, you go to a comedy, different, both empty, your interpretation. Some people like horror movies. Hmm. I have worked with people who masturbate looking at horror movies. Wouldn't be my cup of tea, but <laughs> whatever turns you on. <laughs> the vagaries of human experience are unbelievable. People get off on all sorts of things because they are not me. That's why we, get, we find some people incomprehensible. It's because our little matrix, our frame of interpretation can't expand to include that possibility. So, <clears throat> We have to be careful. Our subjective naming is, of course, not just uh, neutrally conceptual. It's already invested. So if we go back to the eight consciousnesses, mental consciousness, formulating our sense of what's here, is open to suffusion, open to being filled with the five poisons, liking, not liking, anger, desire, jealousy, pride. These intense arousing feelings give an intensity to what I'm perceiving so that it seems to be out there. 
I don't like you. I don't like you. I don't want to see you. People say that and they get an argument. I don't like you. Who is it they don't like? You. Can anyone say who this person is? <laughs> there is no you. There's only you for me in this moment. And I didn't always not like you. I just don't like you now. But I feel it very strongly. And I never want to see you again. Uh, baby, I'm sorry about yesterday. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I miss you. Mm. Come back. Who do you want to come back? Not the bitch of a shirt that yesterday. <laughs> I want the nice version. Come back, sweetness and light, and wear these knickers that I love. Do all of that and we'll be happy. This is the human condition. It's not very impressive. <laughs> so, actuality means the truth, the unformulated truth, is not something made by the guru or by the disciple. Nobody made it. It's not a belief. So you don't have to believe anyone. Certainly don't believe me. You don't have to believe Tilopa or any of the authors here. What you have to do is look at your own mind, start to be aware of how you cheat yourself, how you fabricate interpretations, try and sidestep that a little, look around the corner. Oh, do you remember the Wizard of Oz? Is that yeah. popular in Germany? Yeah. Go on the long pilgrimage. We're off to see the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. And when they get there, they're looking, oh, and they hear this big voice. And they peep behind the curtain. Not so impressive. So it's not what you think it is. It is what it is. So why do I keep thinking about things to make sense of them? Because you are deluded and you're starting from a false assumption. You believe you exist, things exist, and you have to work out what it is. He's saying, no, 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 no. It is the very fact of thinking about you being real and them being real and making sense of it that keeps you stupid. Avoid mental activity. If only you'd had a school teacher like that. <laughs> Class, today, we're not doing thinking. <laughs> Waste of time. So he says, this connection. He's talking about actuality. We're at the top, page 32. Considering actuality without taking it to be mind or non-mind, know it to be singular and free of the many. <clears throat> he said, whatever this is, the thisness of this moment, you don't have to allocate it a graspable identity as mind or not mind. Don't put it in a box. You don't need it in a box because it's arising here. It's fresh. It's fresh. Why do you put it in a box? Know it to be singular. There is this. This moment will never be repeated. Never. Just this. Singular. And free of the many. The many here is meaning the three times. So there's past, present and future. Oh, you were in Germany. What was it like? Oh, it was a different place. Yeah, it was quite good. It was very different from Kamala Sheila. Who cares? We, Jimmy's got an opinion. I like it here. I don't want to go to Kamala Sheila anymore. <laughs> this is better. <laughs> That's what we do. Hierarchy criteria of evaluation. I like this and don't like that. Construction. If you catch yourself, the world doesn't need my opinion. It doesn't need my judgment. It doesn't need my conclusion, <laughs> my assumptions. The world is. Can I receive the world? No, let me tell you about it. I don't need to see anything. I just know. <laughs> I know. Let me tell you. <laughs> this is the position of the ego. Minimum input, maximum output. <laughs> <laughs> so, the actual optimal input, of course it's not coming in from anywhere else, 
optimal presence, if you like, optimal all of this, minimal response. No need to comment because while you're commenting on this, this has vanished and you are commenting on its shadow or more impolitely on the poop it left on the car. <laughs> it's gone. It left this trace. Oh, okay, Fox, I'm not quite sure. Something. <laughs> the past is my poop. It's an excrescence. It's extruded from the moment. You have to squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube. You squeeze the past out of the present. But this present is so big, so entire, you can't get hold of it. It's not a tube. The past gone. Past is gone. Gone. It's just this. It's always just this. When you think of the past, that is your present. When you plan the future, that is your present. But if you think that the future's out there and the past way behind you, then you're deluded because the three times are a delusion. It's always now. Yesterday is now, whatever yesterday means for us. Yesterday, yesterday is gone, gone, gone. My yesterday arising now is now. <clears throat> That's all. And it's an illusory formation. Attachment to the singular is itself the soul binding. So he's saying the actual is singular, like it's one big circular. It's not um, many different things. It's not like the, sh the fragmented mirror or Parvati's corpse. Only one thing, and yet it's not only one thing. Attachment to the singular Everything is God. Everything is holy. All is one. No, 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 no. Attachment to that idea means that you've taken the ungraspable and you've grasped at it by giving it this special title. It is the one. It is the special. It is the divine. It is the spiritual life. It's saying, if you do that, then you get, you get difficulty because that is the soul binding. So, if we go back to the four stages of unawareness, the first one is this just emerging something, then it vanishes. There's something, it's not even clear if it's subject or object, but there's a kind of consciousness there which vanishes. There's a in Tibetan they say, there's no recollection. So there's a kind of oblivion, and then there's a little bit of recollection, but it, it can't find anything to grasp, and so it goes into oblivion again. And then it starts to formulate as one, dagnid, this thing, and there seems to be a apprehendable object, which of course constitutes an apprehending subject. So. Although there's one, it immediately goes into two. This one is not a thing. I am, this is. These statements are the beginning of ignorance. These are the beginning of samsara. This is. This is a place in Germany. This is a tent that we are in. This is a Buddhist meeting. This is, this is, this is. We're used to saying that. We're used to formulating a grammatical interpretation which allows us to normalize the imputation of true existence in phenomena. We believe what we construct. We construct it out there and then see or at least imagine it's out there, and then we believe in the out there-ness of that formation. So that's, our, that's the situation. So he's saying, if you grasp at the singular, then you have one. And if you have one, then you have two, then you have three, and you, you have the multiplication 
of diverse entities, diverse forms. If you see that one and nothing are inseparable, if you could see that appearance and emptiness are inseparable, then whether you've got one or a billion doesn't matter because these are all inseparable from emptiness. But as soon as singularity, the whole, is conceptualized as being just one thing, then you have mental confusion. Does that make sense? So, in, in Patarimbach's commentary on the, the three statements of Garab Dorji, he has this uh, quote, and it says, the yogi develop just as a mountain stream gets stronger by tumbling down the mountain, so the yogi improves his meditation by destroying it. So then you have the use of pet. So what does that mean? It means like when you formulate something, when you conceptualize something, and it seems to be setting like a jelly, gradually the, the, the glycerin is, is kind of whole coming together, disturb it. Because if it sets, it will imprison you. Because everything is dynamic and changing and moving. And what seems to set or settle or be static or be reliable or firm or unchanging is a delusion. Because the actuality is it's changing and moving. That's how it is. So don't grasp, open to it. And this is especially, you know, difficult for many people in meditation because some days meditation, according to our conceptualization, goes well, and some days it doesn't go well. And when it goes well, you think, oh, I'd like to have more of this. And when it doesn't go well, you think, I'd like to have less of this. Because you have taken up a position with regard to it, <coughs> You've got your criteria for uh, attributing worth. I say, let that go. Don't conceptualize the situation. Don't grasp it as something. I mean, don't enter into judgment about it. It is as it is, as it goes. Here, here, here. This is seamless. It's not seamless as an accumulation. It's seamless as the undivided field. So that thing that we were looking at, you look at someone, intensify by focusing on them the sense of their unique specificity, which is true. Each person here is just themselves. You can't replicate one with another. Just themselves and part of the field. Open and empty vibrant field, this. And this will change according to the movement of the field. This is ungraspable, the field is ungraspable, and the ground, the emptiness of the field is ungraspable. So whether you see one or many, special, ordinary, these concepts do not point to anything which you can apprehend, but if you apprehend the concept it will make you stupid. And that's what samsara is. So that brings us to lunchtime. And it's up to you what you do, but you know, he's telling you, don't fall asleep on the job. Death's coming. Dying while stupid is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You get a chance to just lift it up. I, my mind, I am interpreting what's going on. So, when you get your food and you sit at a table, look at other people's plates and think, wow, <laughs> wow, why would they eat that? Then you look at your own plate and think, why did I put all this stuff here? <laughs> it's very, very important. Each moment is shining in front of you saying, you're, you're making patterns, you're making patterns. And then we meet again at uh, 3.30.
So while they're finishing off uh, fitting in the new oven, maybe you could see if there are any more questions that you want to raise, particularly from the text. Nobody else? I just wanted to make sure I understood you uh, properly yesterday concerning oh. the meditation, uh, concerning the two possibilities of either seeing the open space of the ground or of the awareness or seeing the content. Mm -hmm. uh, so I understood, I understood you said there is uh, the oblivion state, that there is nothing there, it's nothing to wish yeah. for, it's, it's not the way to go. But still, there is a difference between having all the perceptions uh, with no thoughts attached or thoughts about the perceptions coming up. So would the one would be the, the space and the other one space filled with content, but not about the content, and the other one seeing the content with the thoughts mm -hmm. come up? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the real difficulty is always aboutness, talking about something. Uh, it's in, about means indirect, and it's not the immediacy of what's here. So when you think about something or talk about it, or have feelings about a situation or a person. There is an object, and there is a connection, and there is a, a formulating a response to that situation. The text saying, this is not, this is not a way to go. Although everything is pure, although all conceptualization has no other ground than openness. There are patterns of arising which are obscuring. They are obscuring because they are particularly tempting for us to believe in them. The position of the judge, which seems to give some power or some formal clarity or authenticity to the gaze. Um, it's a bit hotter today than yesterday. That's a very neutral kind of judgment about something that not so important. But I make that judgment. The judgment expresses <clears throat> my belief in something definite about out there and simultaneously it confirms me as the thinker. So it has the double move of reinforcing both polarities and duality. That's why aboutness is not a good idea. Gossiping, judging. I mean, gossiping can be useful. <laughs> Sia Lama told me a lot of gossip about different Lamas and their shadows and their difficult families and so on. And that was very helpful. He was saying it's empty, it's theater. If you don't do the practice if you don't understand heaven and hell are equally empty good and bad are equally empty so when you enjoy the bad gossip oh, oh, oh they do that where's the juice why is that exciting it's empty they are very good people, they're kind, they rescue people. He's fucking his best student's wife. Oh, oh, why oh? Why wouldn't they if they had a chance? 
<laughs> this is this is a realm of confusion. All kind of bad things happen in monasteries. There are all kinds of predatory teachers who want a lot of money or sex or power who create situations which are very difficult. <coughs> Why would there not be? Someone is a school teacher. Doesn't tell you very much. There may be a useless school teacher, there may be a very good school teacher. There's a big difference between a useful school teacher and a useless school teacher. But just because they're called a school teacher, you have no access to that information. Someone is a lama, someone is a monk. What does it mean? It means you're applying a, a term to identify something. What is the actual living content? It's not to be found in the name. The signifiers are empty. So, whether the mind appears to be open like the blue sky we were trying to find yesterday afternoon outside, whether it seems very open and without content, or whether it has light content or very heavy content, actually there is no difference if you are present because when you're present there is no separation between the mirror and what's arising in the mirror however if you are just a bit tilted away and you're looking at it and you have thoughts or feelings or perceptions about it it's into that arena that the the problematic arises because you've apprehended something to think about, talk about, remember, and so on. You're creating an edifice. So, if you see in the moment that you start to think about something, and you see this arising thought is empty, and the object of this thought is also empty, then subject and object dissolve together. But because there is both a mutual, uh, it's not exactly a repulsion, but a, a mutual pushing away in order to keep the separateness of subject and object. And there is also a mutual attraction because subject and object need each other. Then there is a, an intensity in the relation between the two. And it's quite difficult to recognize that this is an empty thing. I've got something to think about. Dogs like bones to chew on. Human beings like things to think about. The dog chewing the bone can strengthen, help the teeth get a bit clean, it strengthens the gums and so on. What does thinking about something strengthen in you? <laughs> your dualistic identification. Do you want to have dualistic identification? Yes, please, says the ego. Yes, please. And if you don't think about things, how will you, how will you get the sense? You push against things. When you see with very small babies, they're lying on their, their back and they can't turn over, <laughs> kind of rolling about a bit. What are they doing? Well, they're building up the muscles that will eventually allow them to turn over. At every stage as the baby is developing, they're doing things which on one level seem quite pointless, but when it all moves together, they're able to run around. We are maintaining our place in duality. Therefore, the function for the ego is in conflict with the wish to relax into awareness. I mean, that's why these things are more, are more tricky. You, your ego self has a vested interest, an <coughs> investment in maintaining that structure. In therapy, some patients come for 20 more years talking about themselves, telling the same story again and again. There's nothing more to be found in the story. The, the outer formation of the story is not the point. The point is 
I bring myself into shape, into existence. I confirm my, my story self and my story shape by repeating the story. Therefore, the desire to communicate with other people and tell them stories about our life and what has happened to us and how other people responded is very understandable. I want you to believe in me, not even necessarily to like me, but I want you to believe that I exist so even if I behave very provocatively and you hate me, you're at least noticing me and that confirms my existence. But I don't exist. I don't exist. I am. No, I'm not even am. Take out the am. I. The presence. We, we, it's very difficult to talk about this in a, in a meaningful way. Here, this. Now, this will be spoiled by talking about it. How was it for you? I don't know. But how was it? Was it okay? Your anxiety, you, your need for approval, will pull us into dialogue. It's non-dialogic. It's just this. So that, that, that is something we need to be aware of for ourselves. How we make use of other people to confirm to ourselves that we exist and that we're real. Sometimes people talk of narcissism completely the wrong term because Narcissus wasn't looking to anyone else to confirm who he was. He sent all his mates away. He said, I'm sufficient. I'm looking at this blokey in the pond. He's the one I want, which was just a projection of himself. But generally speaking, I want to know that I am here doing something. So that every time we're acting in that way, it's like a subtle internal massage, a kind of confirmation that you do something. So, you know, when, when people are very helpfully going around and picking up the plates and they're saying, are you, are you finished? And they're taking them away. It, and people smile at you and you smile at them. Very difficult to avoid the subtle confirmation. Mm. Nice to help. Here I am. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Can I? Anything more? Mm -hmm. Are you finished? We're sneaky bastards. <laughs> you know, we're up to something. We're up to existence. People kill in order to have a space in which to exist. They murder their rivals in love stories because they want to be confirmed. So there are all kinds of subtle strokes and confirmations that we can seek to elicit from the environment. It says, the mind is alone, alone. It's a present and it doesn't need confirmation. The ego is lonely and seeks confirmation. So the key, the key thing here is always, if we can really release ourselves, then everything will be in that state of openness. But if I, if there's a kind of residual or stuck sense of I'm doing the meditation practice, then the, the gain, the secondary gain of being the one who is the doer will seek a substantiation of my existence. I mean, that's why these kind of moves are very difficult. It's hard. It's really, really hard. Because we do exist for other people and they greet us when we come to a meeting. Many people here have met each other before and we're interested. We have a kind of catch up and they tell you something about their life. And we're sort of interested in that story. 
can we hear it in the manner of a dream? Can we hear it like echoes? Wow, you really, oh gosh, how is that? Oh, I've been there too. Hear all these echoes of stories going around. These things happen. These things happen. No, no things happen, happens, happenings. When you tell the story about the happening, how can you tell the story without it pointing to, I was there, I made it happen, or it happened to me. I was proactive or reactive. Very difficult. Does that mean we shouldn't talk? We should be, we can talk, we can relate, but wisdom and compassion have to be linked. If you get so into the interaction, even if you're listening in a supportive way, lots of empathic attunement, if there's no wisdom of emptiness, it will get solidified. Very tricky. It's hard. Who are we speaking to? No one. We are speaking to movements of patterns of the energy of the ground. Who are we when we're speaking? We are also movements and patterns of the energy of the ground. That's why we get altered when we speak to different people. Some people are, help us to feel expansive and some people help us to feel contracted. How is that possible? If you truly existed, you wouldn't be expanding or contracting. We're back, we go around and around the same circle. We are potential, and the potential is activated in the interaction of subject and object, and subject and object are the potential of the ground. So it's very, when we speak, what are we trying to get from the other person? What are we trying to do to the other person? And some of you... Uh, might remember that uh, I described sometimes uh, being in Nepal at Chattar Rinpoche's little retreat center at um, Yang Le Shun, you know, Shesh Narayan. And uh, lots of things were happening, but anyway, I got a bit sick, and so I spent some time uh, in a kind of fever, and the two Tibetan monks were very helpful to me. And when I felt a bit better and I was talking with them, I said, it must be very nice that you're here. You know, you support each other, you're friends. And one of them said, we're not friends. We're friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievably helpful. Because once you have friends, I mean, for monks, they shouldn't have friends because you get pulled into special relationships and all the rest of it. And it makes a kind of bond that excludes other people and you should be available. So that's a, such a, a lovely notion to be friendly, friendly to everyone, but special friendships where I'll approve of you and I'll confirm your value if you do the same to me. That mutual collapsing onto each other is not so helpful for Dharma practice because there's a, a kind of invisible contract there that says, if you protect my image of myself as I project it, I'll project your image of yourself as you project it. And so we meet as two actors on the stage. Interesting. If we're not friends, I can't predict that you will be available. It's friends should be available. You may or may not be. We're friendly friendly and say in a friendly way, I'm not available. Okay. Because there's no reliance, there's no expectation. It's the expectation that becomes difficult. If I tell you about me, you should be interested in me. You should confirm me. So in terms of, uh, it's not just the content of the mind, but it's what use it's being put to that creates the kind of glue or solidification. Some people grew up in very angry families and their 
They don't like expressions of anger at all. Other people grew up in very angry families and they're fine with anger. They say, oh fuck, I've been here before. Get on with it, I don't care. Yeah, you're in a bad mood, yeah, yeah. It's kind of different. Some people have been in very tender, fused families and they just want to get away with it because they feel invaded and taken over. Other people have that same background and they want to get more fusion in their life. But it's not predicted how it will be. So we can't say that an expression, a particular form of life is good or bad in itself. It's what is it in service of? So somebody could be very kind and helpful in a place like this, always seeing what has to be done and doing that. And it could be that they are maintaining an image of themselves as unentitled to be taken care of. I'm a caregiver, not a care receiver. Should you confirm that? Should you not confirm it? How shall we be with other people? The key point is to see what we're up to. And if you really see what you're up to, what your structure is, then you can be more appreciative that other people are up to something without blaming them or judging them. And you start to see how <clears throat> finding our way to be with each other is difficult because we all have different agendas. And they're all empty. And therefore, if we can see the emptiness of our agenda, <clears throat> we might be able to offer other people more space for theirs, if we can. Okay, shall we proceed with the text? The blessed text. I have so many pieces of paper, but not in the right place. Does yeah. somebody know what page we're on? 32. 32. 32. Uh, Secondly. Secondly. 32. There we go. Oh, yes. <laughs> Secondly, presenting the meditation, I, Tilo, have nothing to teach. <laughs> we have everything to learn, but he has nothing to teach. It's absolutely to the point, isn't it? Do we need to learn something? Do we need an extensive Dharma syllabus so we'll understand Yogacara, Madhyamika and all of that? Or do we need to learn how to learn about ourselves? What is our object of study? We are here to study the mind, our mind in the first instance, which hopefully will help us have more sense of how to relate to the patterning of other people's minds. But he's saying, uh, I don't have an agenda. I don't have a dogma. I don't have a fixed position. He says, my dwelling is not secluded, nor is it not secluded. It's not hidden away. Sometimes not. And, and, and it's not somehow visible. Where will you find Tilopa? He is both visible and invisible. He is empty and he's manifest. So his dwelling in his body in his being in the world, he's not secluded, he's available. But Tilo, Tilopa himself, you can't catch him, which is the same for us. We see each other in our embodiment, 
on the basis of that embodiment, we've got all ideas about what we might project into our interpretation of other people. And so it seems that we're not hidden. We show things in our posture and gesture. And yet, we are hidden. Not just that uh, we've got aspects of our personality which don't come out, don't show through our speech acts and so on, but that our mind itself is never shown. If we can't show it to ourselves, we can't show it to other people. Where does he abide? Just here and also here. Where is just here? Right here. My eyes are not open, nor are they shut. He's not looking at things. He's not trying to make sense of the world. But he's also not cutting off from the world. The world for him is not a problem to be solved. He's not trying to sort things out. Just here. Seeing and not seeing, no different. He's not called upon to be able to do something. My mind is not contrived, nor is it uncontrived. To have your mind not contrived means it's not something that's been created by yourself or others. It wasn't made by the Buddhas. It wasn't made by the demons. It wasn't made by your karma. It wasn't made by your parents. The mind is not a construct. Nor is it uncontrived. Because as the mind comes into formation with other people, it takes on formations which are created. So contrived means uh, so a contrivance is a device, uh, a method of putting things together for a purpose. So we have a little picture of him just a page before, and there he is quacking away on this kind of seesaw to put pressure on the sesame seeds in order to push out the oil. He's using a mechanical device. He's taking up a position. Because of the nature of the mechanical device, he's rocking back and forth to get optimal pressure to push down. It's contrived. He is adapting himself to the situation. But is he contrived in the moment of the contrivance? Is he construing it? Is he thinking about what he's doing in terms of, hey, I'm pretty good at this. In Spain, there's a, a man who sometimes comes to the teaching he comes from Canary Islands, very physically strong, he's a fitness trainer, and he was describing that he's working with one of his colleagues who is going to enter into the international hamon slicing competition. What? Because in Spain they have these big legs of ham which are seasoned. Sometimes the, the pig has been fed on oak uh, kernels and it has a particular flavor, so they have these big legs, and they set them up on a prop, and then, fascinating, <laughs> <laughs> they have to be sliced roughly equal size, a, a, bit, a bit shaped like that, and get them in Spanish restaurants, and these guys cut them so quickly so he's training this guy to be a world champion ham slicer. <laughs> that, that's contrived. <laughs> yes, I did it. So probably Tilopa is not exultant about squeezing sesame seeds. But you can find success and failure in anything. Know that original presence offers mentation nothing to do. It doesn't mean that you're asleep or dull or stupid. You're just here, you're alert, you go for a walk, you look out over the valley, nothing to do. You're not the owner of the valley, you're not a farmer, you're not a forester, 
You don't have to think about rearranging how the trees are. You're just there. <coughs> there are very few hooks from wandering in the environment. If you go back to where you live, as soon as you go in your front door, there'll be endless hooks. Mm -hmm. But here, there's no hooks. <coughs> so there you get a sense. I don't have to think about anything, but you still end up making little judgments about this or that or the other. Why am I doing this? That's what we looked at before. I'm thinking myself into existence. I'm confirming my existence through thinking, but actually, there's no need for it. Pure awareness, if we're completely relaxed, awareness is not made of thoughts, it does, doesn't need reassurance from thoughts, it's not oppositional to thoughts, but it offers mentation nothing to do. Wow. Actuality, how it is, is untroubled by conceptual dichotomizing. So to dichotomize is to set this against that. It's a set up an oppositional structure. How it is, it doesn't care about these things. You might be concerned about your appearance and you might be alert to some colors clashing with each other. So you stand in the front of the mirror in your new outfit, ready to go out, and you think, oh, oh that's not great. The shoes are wrong. I need to go and change my shoes because I want it all to be piece by piece. The mirror is not complaining about your shoes. The reflection, on the level of reflection, all reflections are empty. It's because you think I have to look good for this event, job interview, whatever, whatever, it all has to work. So something is at stake. Whether other people like me or not is important here. I'm trying to put a bend on the situation to make something function for me. That's where the danger is. Something is at stake. I want a specific outcome. The mirror doesn't want any outcome. And actuality, because it is just this openness, offering hospitality to whatever arises, it's not affected by any of these patterns, but the ego is. And so for actuality, suddenly occurring experiences, memories and knowledge are to be seen as false and deceptive and left as they are. These are events which arise and which seem to add value to the situation which seem to be making it the situation better, which seem to be bringing some growth or development, but there's no need for them. Do you need your memories? Well, if it's a functional memory, if you need to know where you left your car keys, that's kind of important. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't need to remember what your favorite food was as a child. Why would you need to know that? You don't need to know the president of any country. You don't need to know anything very much about politics and economics unless somebody's going to pay you. You can learn these things if you want, but they're optional extras. <laughs> so you, your mind's probably full of all sorts of memories which are completely meaningless, except for you because they remind you of this, that, and the other. So he's saying, <clears throat> Actuality doesn't need these things. Your mind could be much more spacious. Much more spacious. But you're full of stuff. And you hang on to the stuff because it reminds you of who you are. But you aren't who you <laughs> think you are. So you're using these memories to make you stupid. You have an opinion about something. What was the real cause of the Thirty Year War? It takes thirty years. Should we should we be on the side of Calvin versus Luther? No. You would if you wouldn't you wouldn't cross the road to think about that unless you wanted to be an academic. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? People have cared, they killed each other for these things. 
really kill, 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 chop head off, chop fingers off, put them on the rack, burn them, stretch them, gouge their eyes out. A lot of killing went on <coughs> between Protestant groups and between Protestant and Catholic groups. Do we need to know? All we need to know is when you come under the power of ignorance and you believe that people are real and they're really different from you and you're frightened of their difference, you're likely to want to kill them. This happens everywhere, whether it's Aztecs in the, in the jungles. People are fearful. So he's, he's trying to say that if you bring a lot of furniture into your mind, the likelihood is that when an event comes in, like a ball, a rubber ball bouncing into this space of your mind, it hits a bit of furniture, hits another, hits another, like a pinball machine, ping pong, ping pong, ball, lights are flashing. If the room is empty, it bounces against the walls and then falls and rolls across the floor. It's the furniture of the mind that keeps the, the movement going. And that furniture is not intrinsic, it's installed moment by moment by our belief that it is furniture. So when, a, when you, in your, in the implication for practice is this, when you're sitting and the thought arises, has it anything to do with me? Why would I get involved? If you're a reasonably honest person and we have a tea break and you go out and you're the last person going out, you probably don't wander around and see, oh, quite a few people have left their bags here. I'll just have a wee look inside. <laughs> Got some money in here. I'll just have a wee bit of that. You probably wouldn't do that. Just like, not my bag. I don't need to look. If it's not yours, you don't look. So you're sitting in the meditation practice, thought arises, has it got your name on it? It's in my mind, it's my mind, it must be my thought. <laughs> poke, poke, poke. Then you find it's a mousetrap. Ah! <laughs> Caught by the thought. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> but if, you, if you get the point of that, the mind is unborn. It cannot be possessed. It is unowned. You sit to practice. You try to relax into the mind itself, which is unowned. And it's your thought. Something's going wrong here. You haven't let go of the idea, I am the one who's sitting, it's my mind, my memories, this is familiar. And so you offer yourself for involvement with the thought. If we really see what all these authors say, the mind is like the sky. Nobody can own the sky. The mind is like the ocean, the waves that come up and go down in the ocean. Nobody can be the possessor of them. The mind is not a thing. It's not an object for possession and there is no one to possess it. So when the thought arises and there's that urge to get involved, there's, you find yourself already in reactivity, <coughs> there is a template of identification of work which is subtly validating that movement or involvement. So again and again, releasing the out-breath, just sitting. But if it's a precious thought for you, if it's a thought that confirms your identity, then you need that thought. Who needs the thought? The mind itself doesn't need the thought. Your ego self-construct, which is illusory and is made out of thought, needs more thoughts. Some of you might have looked at the, the little book, of Proud Little Cloud, that we had, the book for children. Clouds up in the sky. 
wind is blowing, blowing bits of the cloud away. It's sucking up mist from the ocean and regenerating its cloudness. That's the symbol of the ego. Events blow bits of us away. Situations that were holding us in place, work, romantic relationships and so on, they get blown about by the happenstance of life. But we have a reservoir. We suck these transient moments in to repair ourselves. And that's what we do in the meditation. When we think, I need this thought. What do you need the thought for? Remember the old feminist slogan from the 80s? A woman needs a man the way a fish needs a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> a Mahamudra meditator needs a thought the way a fish needs a bicycle. <coughs> you don't need it, but you want it. And that's the important thing. The desire is not a structural need. Awareness has no structural need. The desire comes from the ego. I need to maintain my existence. So he says, if you see that these arisings, which you can make use, they are false and deceptive. They're false and deceptive because they have A, no inherent existence, and B, they're already vanishing, and C, they've got nothing to give you. They should be left as they are. If, if you don't interfere with them, they won't interfere with you. There is nothing at all to value or to devalue, to gain or to lose. The mirror doesn't gain anything from any of the reflections. It's not made happy by beautiful reflections, not made sad by inhuman reflections. Now, this may all seem a bit inhuman, and you might think, well, what on earth would be the point of following this? Because I'm a human being, and I have things I like and things I don't like, and that's what connects me to other people. That's what it means to be a human being and being alive. Fair enough, but you're going to die. And you're going to not be in this human body anymore. And you're not going to be existing with your knowledge, with your family connections, with your culture. And you may come back in a human form, but you could come back in a human form in North Korea or in the Congo, in the jungle, where life is very, very hard. If you're born as an insect or an animal, a lot of fear surrounds you, and a lot of blindness. Insects tend to be just sort of paddling along. The potential of this moment is that you can see into the self-deception of believing that my ordinary way of life is inherently meaningful. The meaning is a construct. How we dress, how we behave towards each other, the kind of food that we eat generally is rather different from our grandparents. What they took to be the case, how they responded to each other with more formality and so on, Spanish. Spanish. What they built their lives on, not what we can build our life on, is just gone. This is a transient, changing place. I remember very strongly going to Amsterdam, early 70s, something like that, and going into a bank, and the person who was serving me wasn't wearing a tie. And I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> because in Britain, people in banks, men, wore ties. He wasn't wearing a tie. That was the beginning of the end. <laughs> <laughs> Almost nobody wears a tie nowadays. It's a complete transformation, being formal. My father wore starch collars. My mom used to starch them and were pinned on to his shirt. Because he had to look very formal. Gone. 
gone. So the world that our parents, even certainly grandparents, great grandparents, their worlds are unavailable completely. The worlds of our childhood are unavailable. So what is it that makes us feel that this is essential? Because so many of the things which have been essential in our past have already gone. The essential has become inessential. The inessential has become essential contingently, depending on circumstances. But in the moment it feels essential, it feels truly necessary. And that gives us this impulse and we get involved. So reflections like these on your own life, your history, you, start, you see how the blinkers come on and the present moment separated from the environment becomes over-invested. Just as we were looking this morning, you focus in on one person, the rest of the room recedes and all your energy is invested in them and gives them a greater, more intense sense of reality and identity. And that's what happens in your mind when you meditate. This transient thought, which is just about to go, just about to go, somehow you have to entertain it, get involved with it. Okay, let's do the Guru Yoga. Okay. Well, I would invite you to consider this uh, statement that he just made. Suddenly occurring experiences, things suddenly seemingly externally there or in your mind, memories and knowledge, knowledge, all the things you know, are to be seen as false and deceptive and left as they are. So I would like you just to sit quietly and reflect on that and then share your sense of it with some people sitting near you. Sudden events, memories, <laughs> knowledge, Essentially, whatever comes in and fills the mind and seems to be you. <coughs> is this really false? Is this really unreliable? Should we just leave it? What do you think? So, what did you make of that? <laughs> we had a big problem. <laughs> yes. Follow on me. If there, if there is fear, and uh, the fear is coming, and you see the fear. 
who sees the fear? Who says this is fear? And after that, you let go. Who is it who lets go? Is it awareness or is it the ego? What do you think? You yourself? Awareness. Yeah. Now, of course, there's a tradition for yogis to be carefree and careless, not to attend to their situation. And that's the case in India, and there are also jumping practices in Tibet, where people just ran around and didn't look where they were going and could have accidents or not. Generally speaking, we don't want to die, although it, everything may be perfect in its actuality. We're, somehow our train hasn't quite arrived in the station. So we want to have a bit more chance to open to this. Therefore, <clears throat> fear, <clears throat> excuse me, fear may, it may be telling us something important and truthful about our situation. Mm -hmm. There may be real danger. In that sense, it's connective, or it could be something arising just in me, which is more telling me about my self-positioning. Mm -hmm. If it's the former, it, it is the movement of subject to an object in the field. And although we, we see both polarities, it would probably make sense for that to bring about a spontaneous engagement that you go out of the way of the car. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't need to think too much about it. Mm -hmm. There would just be a, a perception of a heavy vehicle coming towards me out of the way. If it's something happening inside ourselves, it's more like, well, what status should I give to this? Mm -hmm. Who is the one who is frightened? Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, quarreling parents or very critical parent. Being small, you can't stand up to them. So there's a hesitancy that gets built into your way of being in the world kind of, you look before you step forward. And because there is that pause of looking, you sometimes miss the moment. If you want to get free of that, <laughs> the one who is anxious is a construct, is a kind of echo chamber of fearful situations. Why am I picking this up? Because my actual situation is not being at home as a small person with my terrifying mum. It's, I'm an adult in my life. So this is like a, a ghost that takes me over or an echo that gets me trapped. Who, is, who gets trapped? A construct of self. If I can be aware, this construct of self is arising and as he says, shouldn't be invested in it. I. Every time I believe that it might be true, I put more of my life energy back into it so that when it comes back to me, it's got some force. But the force of the thought is the force I've given the thought. So on a relative level, writing a biography, reviewing the events and so on is useful. Or generally, observing how I tense up in situations, maybe with critical colleagues at work, I'm frightened of what they'll say. Who is the one who is frightened? What could they do? Are they going to stab me? Are they going to throw me out the window? Are they going to humiliate me in public? Probably. Blame, blaming me. They might be blaming me. They might be putting blame out Mm -hmm. I might be t picking the blame up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do they have the power to inject me with blame? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so interesting. Yes. It is as if their cruel world word comes into me. Mm -hmm. But I know that they are a bully. Mm -hmm. They like to make other people small so they can be big. There's a choreography here 
why am I dancing it? What, who is the one who gets hooked in? This is my collapsed echo self from childhood. The hook is strong and it feels true, but it's not true. So that's the difficulty which meditation can be very useful for because when you're sitting in your own place, on your own cushion, they're not coming in the door, they're not coming in the window. This is a bully-free zone. And so the vulnerable aspects of ourself arise, but you find yourself having gone off on a riff of attack or a fantasy of what they're going to say, and there's a fear. Even if you can't stop in the moment after it, thinking, oh, there I go again. This is still very alive for me. It has no real basis. This is a thought construction. Who is the recipient of the thought? If I receive it, I'm still living at the same address that I was in in childhood. The letter comes in the letterbox to me. I'm not at the same address. But who is saying this? Who is saying I'm not at the same address? Mm -hmm. Your rational ego self. Mm -hmm. Who is saying I'm still in my mom's house is your irrational ego self. Mm -hmm. So, in ter hang on, in terms of the um, relative truth, if we look at that way, it's not exactly Mahamudra, but the impure relative truth mm -hmm. is a belief that subject and object are real mixed with the five poisons. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's the frightened person in me. I'm mixed with the fear and the anger I could never express, so it gets turned back in myself and beat myself up and so on. Mm -hmm. Being more aware that this is a contamination, this is a, a carryover, this is something that I, although the originating event was other to self, that other is functionally out of the picture, but the internalized echo of that other is operating in me. So I'm now offering hospitality to both bullying other and bullied self. And both positions seem real. So my commitment to that is confirming my ego identity. I'm not a strong person, I'm not a robust person, I hate conflict, I do anything to avoid conflict. So that's my profile. That's a construct. I look around at the other people, they don't seem to be troubled by that. Why is that? It's not an intrinsic position. All human beings don't feel this. I feel this. This is an adaptive pattern. It has no truth or power other than my belief in it. Someone might want to sit with that. I'm investing my life energy in my own damnation. <laughs> so when you go for a walk and you pass the Trinkala, and you see these lost alcoholics standing there, sitting on the ground, falling over, pissing in their pants. They're maintaining patterns of self-destruction. At least they're doing it more honestly and publicly <laughs> than you. Could you're hiding it inside, beating yourself up in private and painting on a smile. Mm -hmm. I'm beating the shit out of myself. I'm acting as if I'm scum, dirt, whatever the structure would be. You see, wow, this is terrible. You write it down, paint it, dance it, express it, and then you start to feel the possibilities of reshaping. Mm -hmm. The rational. It's the rational ego. And then, where is the awareness? Awareness is the illumination of both of these possibilities. Remember, the ground is neutral. Mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, nirvana or samsara, it doesn't care because it's just open and empty. On the empty theatre stage of your life, all kinds of dramas could be installed and somehow you've got this, or whoever, 
has got this long-running soap opera of abuse. No longer interpersonal abuse, but it's intrapsychic abuse. I'm running this around myself. I am restaging this. I am restaging it. So I have to look, what am I up to? Or, or, I mean, you can, I always believe it's a very good thing to write these things down because then you can look and think, well, I've taken the Bodhisattva vow. I really want to help all beings. And I've paralyzed myself and crippled myself. So what am I doing? I want to be useful. I want to be available. I want to connect. I want more love. I want synergy, connectivity, creativity. And I tie my hands behind my back. Okay. Then I'm not the only one who does this. So I might pray. May all those who are self-imprisoning be free. May all those who hate themselves be freed from that hatred. May all those who don't believe in themselves be freed from that. And by just even saying that, realize, oh, this is an auto-induction. I induce myself into my hopelessness. And it's, it will function as long as I believe in it. When I was small, from quite an early age, maybe five, I think, primarily, I became very, very shy and I wasn't socially comfortable. And I would be out with my parents and they, my dad would say, gee, no one's looking at you. No, no one cares, we're just enjoying something. I'm always thinking. And of course, the more you look at people as if you're kind of thinking they're looking at you, you look a bit weird, so they are looking at you. <laughs> you get this weird circle. <clears throat> I, I loathe children's parties with a vengeance. I used to vomit at them. I couldn't bear this kind of false bonhomie and balloons and all the rest of it. I hated it. I hated it. That was my situation. It took me a long time to realize that I was much more dangerous than they were. <laughs> because I hated them. Because I was afraid. I didn't know how to do the, the connection for whatever reason. There were all sorts of things in the family, but I'm sure it was a karmic result. I mean, I was born 1949, up just after the end of the Second World War. Probably some weird soldier somewhere ended up jumping into my little <laughs> new life with all these kind of anxieties hovering in the background. And, but on, the reason I'm giving the example is it felt so real to me. And even with loving reassurance from my parents, it didn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. I felt anxious. I felt anxious. I didn't want to be near these people. <laughs> Can we be aware of the awareness? No, you can't be aware of awareness, but you can be aware. Awareness is self-illuminating but it cannot know itself as an object. Mm -hmm. can, we, can we feel it? You can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't touch it. You are aware of what is arising. Awareness is like the dawn illumination. It is the light of your life. Here at this very moment, the light that's illuminating our interaction, this is awareness. And inside that, we've got the movements of constitutive cons consciousness which are formulating our dialogue. But when you, the reason I was giving the example from my life is that when you start to process experience in a strongly self-referential way, your own repeated definition of yourself is projected so quickly onto other people. So you're sure that other people are doing to you what you're doing to yourself. And that has more compression. So that's, on a brightly lit stage, that's a very dark drama. The content of the drama has no relation to the brightly lit stage. It's self-encapsulated, self-enclosed. And then, if, if we're lucky, I was lucky, I got various choices chances to move out into the world, different kinds of experience, and I gradually started to release 
some of this uh, tension that was inside me. And the self-reflection can help us to get out? To get yeah, I think, it, I think it can. Just naming it, knowing that you're anxious. Yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so although, although, although I was afraid of people, once I started hitchhiking, I felt very safe, so I hitchhiked across lots of deserts, isolated places and so on, in the middle of the night and all the rest of it, when I was very young, and I never felt afraid because they were strangers. I was afraid of people who knew me and who would have some data bank in their mind about me. I hated walking down the street where I was because it was an old-fashioned place where all, all the people in the street knew everyone's business, and they'd look out the window. And someone would say, Jimmy, what's that you've got there? Hey, pick up that paper. Why are you dropping things in the road? I'm going to tell your mother. Was that, it was like some state. <laughs> and it, it created that kind of sense. Everywhere I go, I'm an object. There's always somebody watching me. And one of the things that helped me with that was being in the Salvation Army <coughs> Hostel Hotel in Calcutta. Old, old Christian thing. And they had an embroidery, a Victorian embroidery on the wall that said, there is an unseen listener to every conversation in this house. <laughs> and I thought, aha! <laughs> Probably a Scottish person. <laughs> wow. Yeah, God sees, God hears. Got his eye on you. <laughs> yes. so I, it, it's very easy to get into these patterns because we are energetic, we vibrate and the vibration continues and in a sense the meditation is the opportunity to retune your guitar <laughs> you can slacken the strings so that they're no longer vibrating to the neurotic tunes of childhood and they can be tuned to something like wisdom and compassion Cool. Now, time for a break. Yeah. Okay. So, we have sensations coming and going, some seem to linger. We have thoughts which seem to have a conceptual form, some kind of beginning, middle and end, but we also have emotions. So, maybe just take a minute or two to think about emotions, gentle, soft emotions, intense emotions. What's it like to feel happy? What's it like to feel sad? Is there a shape to happiness or sadness? Is it a dissolving of the self? What, what, what for you experientially is an emotion? I don't know what it's like in, in German, but in English, you can have a thought, you can have a sensation, but you can be angry or jealous or sad. It seems to be a more kind of ontological quality, almost like a, if you were doing painting with watercolors, you know, you'd have a, a wash that very quickly goes over the paper. Something spreads through you, suffuses, there's this coloration to your experience. And then if, the, if, if you've got a, a thin uh, 
say, a light blue wash across the paper, then quickly you might want to sketch in trees and flowers and so on. But it's the, it becomes the background to whatever you're doing. So if you're feeling sad, you can continue in your life. You can maybe get to work, do some work, come home, go to the shops on the way, whatever you have to do. But it's as if there's an all-pervading mood. So that's something to, you know, in the, in the meditation, although everything is impermanent, some of these states seem to linger. And, and they do linger. <clears throat> it's not just that moment by moment there are micro changes. That's true, but <clears throat> their quality is, is to be a kind of background within which you can notice the changes in external things. And sometimes they don't make a difference. People might try to cheer you up if you're a bit sad, something's gone wrong in your life, or it's a very difficult time, and they're inviting you to do things. And what's the point? Because you're in this state. The meditation instruction for that generally <clears throat> would be exactly the same. Don't merge into it. Don't keep yourself apart from it. Well, that might seem ludicrous, insane, because I'm already merged in it, and I don't know how to get apart from it. If I could get apart from it, I'd be out the door. But I'm in it. You know, it's this is me, and that's why it feels like a quality of being. <clears throat> So sometimes we see these uh, <clears throat> clouds up in the sky and sometimes there's a kind of pervasive grayness that comes. The sky is very, uh, the, the openness of the sky is obscured, the, the clouds are dark and, and there's, a, there's a sort of gray texture that seems to fill things and that's <laughs> more like the depression or the sadness. It's like this. However the mind is, the mind is empty. This sad feeling, which seems to be without top or bottom or anything, seems to fill the whole of your existence. is not a thing. Just as the reflection fills the mirror, this is filling you. If you take up a position in relation to it, I hate this, I don't want this, your friends say maybe you should see the doctor and get some medication, <clears throat> you don't want to do that. Is it you? Is it not you? These are just concepts. Stay relaxed and open with the mind, however it is. Whatever arises in the mind, as the mind has no other ground than the empty ground. This sadness has no content of its own. It won't kill you. You might, in a reaction to it, decide you want to kill yourself. That's a whole other story. It itself is just a feeling tone. Some feeling tones are very difficult. For example, children often find boredom very difficult. They don't want to be bored. It's horrible for them. Something should happen. Do something to take me out of this. But it may not be possible. There may be some long journey and there's no way of changing it. Relax into it. Now, if you believe that relaxing into how it is will intensify the merging, then it, you, you're convinced it will make it worse. So if I want to get out of this, I have to resist it. But I don't have any ground to stand because it's already pervading me. So 
You're sitting in the sadness. Allowing the sadness to be wherever it is, it's everywhere. And then you just sit like that for as long as you need to. You get up from the practice, you're still feeling sad. You go to sleep, you're still feeling sad. You're developing some chronic tendency in this direction. And you just stay with it. <coughs> why else? Why would I do this? Well, there's nothing else to do. Mm. It's here. It is as if this is me. But it wasn't here before. After some time it will be gone. Existentially, it is not me. I am not this. Yet it feels as if I am this. So you have a very subtle identification in which the not me is me. From the point of view of practice, you just said nothing. I'm not doing anything, I'm not meditating, this is ridiculous, it's a waste of time. These are thoughts. These are easier to deal with because it's just going. This is not going. You just sit with it. If you don't move, eventually it will move. And while it's here, what's the basis of your persecution? I don't like it, I don't want it. It's getting in the way of me doing what I have to do. No. I don't feel like myself. <laughs> you see all these constructs which arise with regard to something like this. So there's all kind of questions have been like, well, so who are you? What is it that would give you an identity which would never be susceptible to sadness. You're sad because you're able to have experiences and the experience at the moment is sadness. You can just be sad. You are sad. You can just be sad. But why am I sad? Just be sad. But why am I sad? So when you... <clears throat> these are all subtle ways of trying to get outside it and look at it from the outside and understand what it's all about. You want to go up in a helicopter and get an overview. And the texts always say, don't do that. Because what you will be doing then is you'll be increasing a, a fissure in your mind between subject and object. And the problem about the sadness is it's not a clearly defined ob object. It's both subject and object. So the more you divide it and cut it up, you get more angry that nothing changes. Just open to it. And sad. Maybe other people will be upset that you're sad. Very often people don't like their friends or family being depressed. They want them to get better soon. But I'm just sad. Why wouldn't you be sad? It's one of the flavors that's around. I'm sad. Or I'm bored. Or I'm lazy. I don't want to. Can't be bothered. This isn't like me. I'm not like this. You are now. I used to be so active. I enjoyed life. I did so many things. It was amazing. And now I don't know. So whatever is coming, however it is, if you enter into the commentary about your experience, it's like being a child arguing about bedtime. You're not going to win. You know, you're, not, you're not going to be able to work out how to be in relation to the tiredness or the sadness, you just are it. You have to be it. So emotions are not the enemy, but what they do is 
the insult the ego by pointing out you're not in charge. You didn't choose, you don't choose the content of your mind. You don't experience the world on your terms. Life happens. This is a life happening and it's happening to you. But if you can allow it to happen as you, it goes out and then you have a more sense of I have these different forms, just as Padmasambhava has eight famous forms, Tara has 21 famous forms, many deities have multiple forms, Chinrezi has a two-arm form, a four-arm form, a thousand-arm form, he's standing, he's sitting and so on. There are many, many forms and one form of your life is sad, one form is angry, one form is full of desire, jealousy, one form is hard-working, reliable. One form is lazy and can't be bothered. These are all arisings, and when they arise, they fill this space. If it's my space, then it is as if I am sad. It's my mind. If it's in my mind, it's mine. Is it your mind? In this uh, book, with these different accounts, they're never saying that your mind is a possession of your ego. It's, they're suggesting that the ego is a distorting content of the mind. The mind is not a private possession. It's not a private territory. It's an openness. And so into the openness, these emotions come. But we live in a society where there are socially acceptable emotions and emotions that are not so acceptable. In many companies nowadays, swearing at your boss will get you the sack. We don't tolerate this behavior. Maybe swearing was the only way that you could convince your boss that he was an asshole. <laughs> He behaves in an arsehole way, he persecutes you, he gives you a lot of trouble, and he doesn't want to know it. So his position of power functions as a denial of his incompetence. And after a while, you've had enough of it, and you tell the truth, and you get the sack. That happens. We are in samsara. The ground of samsara is not knowing its own ground. It's all very real, except it's not at all real. But in as much as it's all very real, why should I suffer this horrible boss? So then people get into reaction, and then your reaction is judged. So I judge the boss as useless, the, bo the boss judges me as rude. He has more power than me, and I now don't have a job. And this kind of chain reaction of definition goes on and on and on. So what the, the texts in, are here are suggesting is you are not the owner of your mind. Your sense of self is a movement within the field of experience which arises in the space of your mind, in the space of awareness. The space of awareness is not owned by the ego. So it is as it is. It arises due to consequences from previous actions. These are karmic outcomes and it's like this. So when you enter into a reactivity to how it is, this is an ego formation which is functionally powerless in relation to what's arising creating more splitting by hyper-reactivity. And they're all saying, just stay open with the mind, however it is. Stay open with it, because that is your choice. You can merge, or you can resist, or you can stay on the point. It's only three options. Try to push it away, it doesn't go. Merge into it, and you're trapped. 
stay on the point. This is the point of emergence, the here and now. And if you st keep staying on the, you know, on the here and now, whatever it is will resolve itself and something else will arise. So emotions are very, very tricky especially when they're held in place by judgments. So if you feel there is an injustice and you're tired of injustice and it's not right and you start to feel angry, angry on behalf of women, children, black people, immigrants or whatever, it's a, it's a good cause, it's worth fighting for. On one level that's true. But in, for meditators, that's quite tricky <coughs> because you're saying that this shape, this current structure is not empty. It's full and it's full of badness and it should change. So this is a conceptual interpretation of a structure in the world. It's not that you should simply say, oh, life happens, let them get on with it. But if you are going to get make some contact with the structures of the world you have to have a sense of where the flexible points are where the points of articulation are where the the plates rock and move together i, I don't know in germany but in britain there are some professions which tend to be very very sensitive one of the most sensitive is called social work. Social workers don't like to be wrong. So if you have to make a complaint to a social work that the worker that they're not carrying out their job, you have to phrase it very, very well. They have legal departments, they'll fight you, they'll lie and cheat and cover up, in my experience. Tricky business. They're supposed to be looking after a child. They're not protecting the child. They don't have the resources to protect the child, but they have the job of protecting the child. They can't do their job. It's not their fault. They don't have the resources, but they have to carry out their legal obligation, which they can't do. But they don't want to be blamed because it's not their fault, because they don't have the resources. You can see how that one runs round and round and round. So you come in and you make your complaint, they don't say, welcome friend. Very tricky. How do you challenge people? Should you bother challenging them? You're not going to get very far, but you might feel ethically you have to. These are the micro movements of life. Should you complain? Should you not complain? How will you phrase it? What's the point of doing it? Mm -hmm. Too passive and life turns you into a victim too active and you're just punching stone walls and bruising your knuckles you have to be skillful and skillfulness it arises in buddhism from emptiness wisdom of emptiness means you see that it's not so real you don't have to believe what other people believe but you have to know that they believe what they believe so the social workers believe that they're doing their best and blah blah blah, blah. So how do you work around that? That's, that's what many of us face in our lives, working with systems which are not corrupt, they're just badly managed, under-resourced, the staff are tired, they've had it up to here, nobody ever praises them, everybody wants something from them. So in these kind of situations, you have to, you have to see, okay, what is the possibility in this situation? For example, let's take a, an outer example. In Tibet, about 25 years ago, there started to be a, quite a lot of protests against the Chinese. Sometimes uh, monks, even nuns, were burning themselves. People were marching in the street and campaigning. And then they're taken away. Buddhist nuns, they're being raped with ca electric cattle prods. Nothing changed except more soldiers, more armed police arrived in these areas of Tibet. 
was it skillful to protest? He said, no, nobody's got the answer to these things. This is a very complex world that we live in. So from the point of view of meditation, it's not that you shouldn't act, but the best preparation for action is to sit and be with your mind and see how you get distracted by your own habitual thought patterns. Try to release this habitual addiction and intoxication. Then you have more freshness, more clarity. Then doing the Vipassana scanning, then you're seeing these events which can be so solid and real, are solid and real because you've cooked them, you've added other ingredients. What's the simplicity of it? And then you can try to relate into the, com into the complex patterning of simple moments and see what you can do. But once you build up a head of steam, of steam and say, this isn't right, something has to change, what's going to change? If you go on a farm, you see these big metal cages where if they're wanting to give injections or whatever to a big bull, they have to get them in the cage and they lock at the door and they're pushing and they have cages for pigs as well. Animals don't want to be there. They're going to push. So people will push as well. The truth doesn't bring freedom. Mr. Trump doesn't want people telling him the truth of their perception about him. He doesn't want that. People say, you're a liar and a cheat. He says, fake news. <laughs> fake news. Who would believe it? I don't believe it. You guys, you're the ones. How would you have a conversation with someone like that who, who is so skilled at collapsing conversations and returning to I'm the best monologues? So often in life with bosses at work, with people you have to deal with, insurance companies, pension plans, all the rest of it, it's just like that. These are people who don't want to hear. So on an ordinary level, when you manifest into your world, you have to have a meditation that will help you go there. Otherwise, you sit in your meditation cushion for a little holiday from the horrors of the world, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really change anything. We need to have clarity and insight. So that's why I say your memories, your knowledge, if you take this as strongly real and you have a grounds to complain, this is not right. In the first place, is well, why would you believe yourself? Don't believe that. You are intoxicated. You think you know the truth. Have a holiday, have a rest. Now you know this is a possibility, this is a pathway. The people I want to contest with, they have pathways as well. How do you get a win-win situation? It's very tricky, very, very tricky. You have to remember lots of these big Tibetan lamas can't travel out of India have had all their financial resources seized by the government. They can't access their bank accounts and so on. Life's hard for lots of people. They might be sitting on a throne with a fancy hat, but they can't get put a bit of plastic in a hole in the wall. So idealizing fantasies, not very helpful. It's complicated. But if you stay close to the complication, you can stay relaxed, grounded, and open, and then move in the field of complexity. There is no banner of truth. When the first crusade, oh no, it was the second. When the second crusade set off, you went via what was. Uh, the remnants of Constantinople. It's a great, great center of 
Orthodox Christianity, full of monasteries, books, paintings, icons, came into Istanbul and trashed it, burnt the churches, killed the monks, threw the icons into the Bosphorus. They're not proper Christians. In a world like this, don't believe in justice. Don't believe in truth. Believe in nothing at all. Stay with the emptiness of nothing at all and see everything as an illusion. That's what they're saying. So the Western liberal attempt to bring rational justice, United Nations and so on, provides jobs for some people. <laughs> I remember in India, <clears throat> You're out on the hot, dusty road and whoosh, a white Land Rover shoots by. UNICEF, United Nations Children's Fund. Where were they going? For a picnic in the country. Middle class Indians got a lot of these uh, non-governmental organization resources. Why, why should they be honest? This is samsara. Ideas like honesty and truth you have to hold them with a bit of a question. Well, not very inspiring, is it? But sad. <laughs> sad. But it's absolutely true. You look everywhere and you see that. There, he's not saying believe in dogmas, believe in other people as being noble and courageous. He's saying look at your own mind, look at how you cheat yourself. And if you're clear about that, you at least will wake up and you will also have woken up to the fact that other people cheat themselves. The story of, of Sialam. He was invited to give uh, an initiation in Ladakh. They drove him out to, to this place. And, as with many of these monasteries, they're built on top of uh, a hill. And so they had many steps going up to it, no road going up to it. And they carried him up in a little palaquin, got to the top, took his shoes off, put them outside, went inside, did the initiation, came outside, shoes gone. Someone had stolen his shoes. They are all... He said... They were very good shoes. I got them in Europe. They're really good shoes. Why would someone living in this dry, dusty land full of sharp stones not want my shoes? I put temptation in the way of the thief. 90% of the fault is mine. 10% is the thief's. It's like that. Why, why would you imagine that people will not steal your shoes? Why would you imagine people won't cheat you? Why would I imagine I'll get on a plane on Tuesday night? <laughs> <laughs> These things happen. So what this is, what I'm trying to suggest is all of these are conceptual constructs moving out into space. I know how it will be. This is how people should behave. If we all behaved in this way, life would be so much better. Cooking up a storm of concepts and imaginings and... But there's no, there's no substance to them. There's never any substance. These are all illusory forms. If you have immediate contact with people, then there's something perhaps that can be done. But daydreaming about an ideal world and what we have to do, a lot of that just goes nowhere. Because people don't want to do it. So we see that with climate change. So from the Dharma point of view, engagement in the social world, in the economic world, in the environmental world, is fine if you understand what it is. These are illusory patterns with complex causal forces held in place by people's reified notions. It's a contested territory. It will always be a contested territory. 
And if you enter into it, you're entering a field of contestation, a field of struggle and difference. And so it helps if you're very clear. Do we find it difficult to change our habits? Do we find it difficult to not go after a thought when it arises in our mind? Yes, we do. And we have had some support and some education in meditation, some of us, for many, many years. So even with all the support, we find it very difficult. Why would we then imagine that other people will find it easy? This is samsara. So, now he's thirdly going to talk about conduct. Do not strive at austerities in the forest, as the Buddha was doing before he awoke. Don't starve yourself, don't beat yourself. You will not find happiness through bathing and ritual purity. In India, Brahmins have to wash before they go to the temple, so they do a lot of believing that you can wash the external dirt out. Moreover, you will not gain liberation by making offerings to the gods. Come to know the idleness free of accepting and rejecting. Be idle. Don't do anything. Idle is an interesting word. It basically means lazy. Don't be so active. Most activity involves merging with a thought. You have an idea. I watched a little bit the maneuvering to get the new oven in. There was quite a lot of thinking and moving and bodies. <laughs> That's useful thinking because there is a shape which is quite small and the cook has got to be just right and there's lots of things to be joined up, the wiring <laughs> and so on. That is connective thinking, non-speculative, productive thinking of bringing something into formation. He's not saying that that's unhelpful. He's saying, in particular, speculative thought, thought that ungrounds you, that fills the space with fantasy, that's not helpful. So leave that. Just, just be lying as if you were on the beach someplace, nothing to do, the seas rolling by, the sun shining, nothing to do. Better to be happy and useless <laughs> than to be driven and useful but troublesome. <laughs> of course, people want to feel that they have a good life, that they have created the situation they need. This, his talk here, he's talking about yogis who are not constructing their life, who are inhabiting a life which is just as it is. We can hardly imagine that because we are deeply embedded in the task of self-management. Anybody who's got access to the internet and to texting and all kinds of communication is ceaselessly having to manage their life, to respond through pathways. It wasn't like that in his time. So we need to be more careful about thinking the constant invitations to be involved, to be busy, and the possibility of saying, no, I don't want to do this. This is not necessary. Your system is overcomplicating. There are many, many, many scams around in the world of emails and internet connections because it's an open field and good people use it and bad people use it. So you can't trust. It's just like that. So keep, so he's really saying, keep your eyes open. And if you're driven and you're very busy, you probably won't see it coming. Fourthly, presenting the result. 
the result according to circumstances. Awareness of one's intrinsic thusness is the result. That is to say, by having less dualistic involvement, by settling and just being present, you see directly that thoughts have no self-substance, <coughs> arise and pass. Sensations have no self-substance, arise and pass. And therefore, the intrinsic thusness, which means you're just here without effort. Being here is not the product of construction or making or pushing away bad things or hanging on to good things. It's just as it is. Then you have peace. I am basically fine. Basically, from the ground, this is okay. And then you interact or you, the interaction arises. The moment one awakens to this, there is no path to follow. It is as it is. Now, of course, in the world, we have many, many hierarchies of value. Value as a human being, as a sexual human being, as a physical human being, as an intellectual human being, and so on. But constantly grading and moving forward and doing things. You're okay as you are. Really? I could, I could do more. If you do more, you will not be better than you are. You'll just be different. <laughs> so, the vertical axis is a deceit. The only true axis is horizontal. You have diversity, difference. I speak French very badly. When I go to France, I'm fairly incomprehensible and I get more incomprehensible as the years go by because I never practice. French people tend not to be particularly supportive to other people who don't speak their language very well. So they kind of look at you, okay. It could be better. It is what it is. Don't you want it to be better? How would it be better? Then I'm gabbling about this and that. Do I want to have that kind of blah, 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 blah? Not really. <laughs> what would be improved in my life by having French people love me? Very little. It, it, it could be respectful to them. It could be a, a mark of uh, entente cordiale. But I can't even be bothered. So it is what it is. Is it worse? In what way is it worse? I'm just there with incomprehension and either we find a way forward and we don't find a way forward and it's like that. Incomprehension, lack of ease, fairly normal in my life. Wouldn't it be better to try harder? And then where would I get to? Oh, it would be easier. What would be easier? To have meaningless conversations in another language? Do I not have enough of them in English? <laughs> better. The notion of vertical, of better, improved, is going to be like this, it's going to be like that. Put it down there. I am incompetent at communicating in French. Minimal competence. In German, zilch. But anyway, in French, a little bit, a few words, a bit of vocabulary, school, grammar. What is that? That's me. Should I be other than I am? <coughs> what would that mean? Do you understand the basic thing? It's not an arrogant positioning. It's just to say... Here and now is not a construct. It is just this, within just this, within presence. It is as it is. And even if you change or develop your qualities and your skills and you're able to do more, it is highly likely that in that process you will unground yourself. Why? 
because you'll be tilted towards a future which is out there somewhere. Where are you? You're here. And if you're here, oh, it's like this. It could sound complacent. He called it lazy. He called it, no, he didn't call it this. I called it lazy. He called it idle. Idle means non-productive. It's not going anywhere. In winter time, when people are warming their car, the engine's idling. It's just going round and round. It's not driving anything. Where should I go? So each person can look at that. There's things I could do to improve my life. Would they improve you? Who are you to be improved? Are you the sum total of your qualities? Are you a construct? Nobody in this book says you are. We feel we are because it's a social identification. Whether you have a lot of qualities or no qualities, the main point is, are you awake to your own ground? Do you see the movement of the emergence of empty formations? This is the big difference. You can be incredibly sophisticated in the world and able to do all sorts of things, wonderful on the slopes in winter, skiing here, skiing there, water skiing in the summer, got your private yacht, got your condominium, got this private helicopters, all kind of people, very, very successful. And their mind, they are the managers of their success. Are they aware? How do you become aware? You become aware by sitting in your bum and doing nothing. How do you get enough money to be able to have a private helicopter? Not by sitting on your bum and doing nothing, but by wheeling and dealing and being out there, making friends and pissing on enemies. Seems to be the rule of success. So it's very important to think, we're going to die. How should we use our time? What, is our, what are our criteria for evaluation? And if the axis is vertical, do we really want to climb the greasy pole? Is it going to be worthwhile? Well, that's, there's worldly success and there's awakening and they're not the same. And if you have limited time, you have to choose what you want to do. Very few people have both. So he's saying, the moment you awaken, there's no path to follow because you are here. And if you're here, there's no path to here because you're always already here. Here is always here. Everything that occurs is here. There is no other. There is no other place. There is simply here. And this here can be small, 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 or it can be the whole sky, the whole universe, all the different galaxies that they keep discovering, new galaxies and new galaxies. It's all here. It's in the mind. It is the, the display of the mind. So he says, yet the foolish of this world go searching for it elsewhere. They think that there's something somewhere else. If I develop these qualities, if I allow this, if I go on pilgrimage to India, if I climb a particular mountain, if I sit in a cave, it will be better. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Why not? Yes, places have blessings. How much blessing? Enough blessing to cover the carbon footprint of flying to India. And when you get there, you sit in the cave, up in the Himalayas or somewhere else. Padmasambhava was in this cave. Now I'm in this cave. <laughs> it's quite cold in this cave. <laughs> I wonder if he had a better cushion than me. <laughs> Wherever you are, you have to be with your mind as it is. Going to a holy place will not profoundly alter the structure of your habitual thinking. It will provide a flavor, a transient flavor of a new experience and some lift and joy, and that may help you for a period of time. 
It's not to piss on these things, but we <coughs> know these things from experience, that the deep structures of our habitual formation are with us. So seeking blessing from something else as if it was going to profoundly transform us is, is ridiculous from this point of view because <clears throat> what you need is always here. Where are you? I need to get that before I'm whole, but you're already whole. The gurus, all these gurus here are saying, Mahamudra is your own original face. It is your own condition. Well, that's all very well, but I need to go there. That's the ego. The ego is lost. It doesn't know where to go. So he says, cut free from following hopes and fears. This is happiness. Imagining that will be better and that will improve me. Imagining I have to avoid that because that will be worse and that will destroy me or mess me up. This is the subject and object interaction. Sitting here, subject and object move around in the mind. Always playing, always creating games and stories. It's just sitting. Oh, this is the movement of the mind. The mind doesn't move. This is the movement of the mind. The movement of the mind is inseparable from the mind. So he says, this is happiness. Then, the last section of this, if someone pacifies their minds grasping at a self, the appearances of dualism are completely purified. So, I'm <coughs> I've got a self, I'm not very happy with myself, I want to improve myself, I'm going to go to a place where the self can be improved, I'll go to Rishikesh or Hardwa, holy places by the Ganga. <coughs> that will be better. We have all kind of ideas of what will be better. Where are we now? Where are we now? So, in order to pacify the mind's grasping at a self, this grasping arises in the here and now as a content within the here and now, which is ignoring the truth of the here and now. In the sight of awakening, there is sleep. In the sight of brightness, there is dullness. The dullness is the addiction to the self as an object. I have to take care of myself. No. Self is a possession. Self is something I have. Self is something to be made better. So he says, when you stop grasping at the self, when you buy a dog and you decide you don't want a dog and you give it back to the people, then you don't have a dog. Then you don't need to take it for a walk in the morning, you don't need to take it for a walk in the evening, you don't need to stop it shitting on the carpet, you don't need to stop it scratching the sofa. No dog. Sad. Sad, <laughs> Sad for some, according to karmic disposition. <laughs> If we substitute self for dog, <laughs> can you return yourself to where you bought it? Where did you get yourself? The only store in town, the Dharmadhatu. So you have to go to the Dharmadhatu. I've got a self, I've had it a very long time, but would you like it back? <laughs> Looks in a bit of a mess. What are we supposed to do with it? I don't think Dorji Chung wants another dirty <laughs> self hanging around here. So you give the self back. This self is an aspect of the Dharma Dhatu. It has never separated from the Dharma Dhatu. My self is not mine. That is liberation. I am not me. I, I'm not even am. I am. 
This is different from a lot of the Hindu Vedanta. It's just I. It's just fresh and open. And the energy of that ground manifests as I am. Mm. But I am is not the ground. I is the ground. In fact, the ground is just open without any I. Mm. Open, I, energy, and all the different moves of life. So yourself is not yourself. Yourself is your burden. Yourself are the dark, is, is the dark glasses that stop you awakening. You don't see because you're the custodian of a self. So when you pacify the mind's grasping at a self, when you recognize, <clears throat> this is not me, why am I hanging on to it? It's not me. This self has changed continuously since I was born, and I keep thinking it's me. But it's, it's always not what I want it to be. That's why I'm always trying to make it better. When you see that, the appearances of dualism are completely pacified. Just settle. Like this. Without thinking, imagining, or diagnostic analysis, <clears throat> without meditating, or acting, or hoping, or fearing, the mental constructs that support such grasping at something are liberated where they are, and with this one arrives exactly on the primordial actuality. So from the ego point of view, how shall I live? Where shall I be? How will I earn my money? Who shall I live with? Who shall I share my time with? This arising, all these thoughts, mesmerizing, intriguing, energizing, where do they come from? They're arising in your mind. Where is your mind? How is your mind? You sit open, sitting. Oh. Mind is empty and mind is full. When I look for my mind, I don't find anything. And yet, without effort, my mind is constantly full of color, shapes, memories, hopes, fears. They pass through the mind. They are not the mind and they are not other than the mind. So without changing anything of your life, whether you're selfish or lazy or prone to jealousy or rages, whether you feel stupid, whether you feel other people hate you, whatever the content of the mind is, don't rely on the content to tell you what the mind is. Stay with the knower, relax and be present with the moment of awareness then the empty mind is full of what it is and it isn't. And that's liberation according to Mahamudra and also Sokshin. With that, you function in the world as you are, relating according to the tendencies you had. If you're a lazy person and you see that the ground of your laziness is empty, it doesn't suddenly transform you into an energetic person. You are a lazy person with the energy of laziness as the current patterning of how the Dharmakaya is showing itself. With whatever your formation, there is nothing other than the energy of the ground However the energy of the ground is, it is the breath of the Buddha. From the ego point of view, that sounds insane, because there's good and bad, there's right and wrong, there's kind, there's cruel. Ah, there's all the binaries, there's all the polarities. That's how the ego organizes itself. If you see the ground of the mind, all the polarities arise in the mind. It's the play of the mind. But if you impose them on the mind as a template which will organize your actual lived experience, then you've got crazy. High, low, good, bad, hot, cold, self, other, all of these, this and not that, that and not this, and yet this and that are born together, high and low are born together, sweet and sour are born together, all opposites are inseparable. This is a little pulsation that keeps the pulse of the world moving and moving. 
I mean, you see, everything has the same ground. However, it is, it is what it is. That's why the texts say, everyone is a Buddha. You don't have to polish yourself and change yourself to be a Buddha. Buddha means inseparable from the ground. If you recognize that, then you're a Buddha like that. Like Milarepa says, if you, if you recognize it in the morning, you're a Buddha in the morning. If you recognize it in the evening, you're a Buddha in the evening. It doesn't mean you, that you look like a Buddha statue. <laughs> it means that this light, this immediacy never leaves you. Wherever you are, in whatever situation, you haven't moved anywhere. You cannot leave here and now. You never, ever, ever go anywhere else. Everywhere else is in here and now. On Tuesday, God willing, inshallah, <laughs> I will be in Frankfurt Airport. I will go from here to Frankfurt Airport. Where is Frankfurt Airport? It's in my mind. At the moment, it's in my mind as a nebulous thought. Hopefully, luckily, on Tuesday, Frankfurt Airport will be in my mind as a direct experience. And the gates will open and I will go through and I will sit in the joyful company of Lufthansa in an airplane, plane and that will be my here and now. I can only ever be in my here and now. I cannot be in there and then. It's unavailable, off the menu, except in the realm of self-deception. I'm dreaming about there and then. I can only be present here and now. Always, forever. Amen. This is it. This is it. And it's, there's no limit to it. That's who, in the Dzogchen text we looked at, this is the diversity. <laughs> Everything is within here and now. It doesn't come out of here and now and go anywhere else. Here and now is India, Canada, Quebec, Iceland, anything you want. Here and now is here and now, if you are here and now. If you are not here and now, then there and then will be even more real than here and now. Because your here and now will just be imagined the way there and then is imagined. The as if, the imagined, is a fabrication. Here and now is uncontrived, unfabricated. So that's why when we do the practice, we just sit in, Whatever comes, comes. Whatever goes, goes. We don't move from the sight of arising. That is the Dharma Datu. That's the Akanishta Dharma Datu, which is where Doji Chang lives. There's nothing higher than that. Just this. So, let's do a little bit of sitting. So we do the Guru Yoga of the White R. o'clock we have the Padma Sambhava practice. Um, 
I don't know how many copies there are of the text here, but you can sit together and share them and participate. If you're used to it, then it's what you know, and if you're not used to it, then you get a sense of what that uh, structured practice is like. Everything is arising here and now. So if we just keep the flavor on, keep the sense of it as you move out, going up the stairs, getting food and so on, in every situation, where am I? Here and now. Location and duration are conceptual grids across which you locate the objectified phenomena of the world. You want to relax out of that into the immediacy, just this, just this. Okay. Thank you.